and our line manager. Okay, fabulous. Welcome to today's meeting of the Housing and Homelessness Committee. Today is Wednesday, March 1st. Um, so far, I'm joined by my colleagues, Councilmember Rodriguez and Councilmember Lee, and looking forward to other committee members joining us as they become available. Mr. Verano, can you please call the roll? Councilmember Rahman. Here. Councilmember Blumenfield. Councilmember Blumenfield is absent. Councilmember Harris Dawson. Councilmember Harris Dawson is absent. Councilmember Rodriguez. Here. Councilmember Lee. Here. Three members and a quorum, Madam Chair. Okay, so today we have 12 items to consider on the agenda. I want to just go through the items quickly. I think uh, a few, quite a few of them can be, um, can go on consent, so hopefully the meeting will not go too long. Item one uh, is reports from the CAO and from the Bureau of Engineering about CEQA exemptions and lease authorities for bridge home sites in CDs 8, 13, and 15. Um, it also talks about lease and contract extensions for the LA Grand Hotel in Council District 14, for which funding will come from the recently established homelessness emergency account. That's funding controlled by the mayor for her Inside Safe program that the council authorized a few weeks ago. Um, the report also talks about funding to support rehab work at several project home key sites and the 16th homelessness roadmap. Item two is a motion about uh, authorizing LAHD to apply for funds from HUD for lead hazard remediation, but this item is actually incorrect, so we're gonna continue it and reintroduce another motion with the correct date on it, um, which I, I believe will be the best way to proceed here so that we won't be discussing this item today. Item three is a motion uh, about properties owned by faith-based institutions located in Council District 5. It's asking for information on them and the potential impact of Senate Bill 4, um, should it pass. Item four is a report from LAHD about raising income limits for affordable housing projects that are HHH projects, but focused on ones that serve veterans specifically. Item five is a motion about getting more informa information about the cyber attack that targeted HACLA in December of 2022. Um, item six is a report from the housing department about improving evaluation processes, contract procedures, and timely payments between the city and LASA, and it offers some recommendations that I think they're gonna be presenting about and I'm sure we'll have some discussion about. Item eight is a report from LAHD about a fast track solutions loan program for affordable housing projects that are already in our pipeline. And this is basically relating to a new problem that we're facing, so I, they'll be here to present on it today. Item nine is a CAO report, which we discussed last time and continue to today, about a citywide rehousing strategy for um, uh, people who are living in RVs and who are experiencing homelessness there. Item 10 is a report about a pilot RV to home program that uh, was implemented uh, to great success in Council District 7. Item 11 is a motion about establishing a small housing provider assistance program um, and instructions to the city to identify some federal and state resources for the preservation of this housing in the hands of small mom and pop landlords and support for additional rental debt relief. And item 12, which is the last item, uh, will be a verbal update from LASA, which will give us a little bit more context about CES, the coordinated entry system, and a little bit more of an understanding of where CES is utilized here um, and potentially some changes that might expedite placements. So before we begin um, public comment, I understand that LAHD has an amendment for item six on today's agenda. So if somebody from LAHD is here, they can read the item into the record now so that public comment can address it. Uh, good afternoon, council members. I just wanna clarify, uh, I think it's agenda item eight, correct? Yes. Okay, I just so, want to make sure you're making the right one. Wait, uh, no, I believe it's item six. Uh, the supplemental memo to. I can, I can, I can read that into the record um, if you want for for good measure to ensure that that's also included. I'm sorry. Item six is the um, improvement of contract procedures between the city and LASA. That's mm -hmm. not the amendment you're looking to read right now. Ana okay. Gomez will be reading that for the department on that item. Item eight is separate. And do you want to read both items before public comment? Oh, we, we could certainly do that. 
Okay. I mean, if, if item eight is a technical amendment, we're fine to read that when we're discussing it, but I'm happy to have both of them read into the record beforehand. Great. Well, I, I can I can address item six, Madam Chair. Um, so for item uh, for item six, um, the the revised LHD transmittal um, removes a recommendation a um, titled flat term agreement implementation for general fund contracts and updates the letters of the remaining recommendations in the revised transmittal. And there's no other changes being made besides the removal of that first recommendation. Okay, thank you very much. Do you want to read the uh, amendment for item eight now as well? Uh, I'm happy to, sure. Go ahead, Liz. Um, this is a supplemental report for council file number 230206. Um, please be advised that LHD would like to update council file number 23-0206 with the following recommendations. Uh, number one, reduce the amount requested to be obligated from 35400000 to $28,400,000 by reducing the amount of re amount requested from Program 59T, the City of LA Housing Impact Trust Fund, from $7,853,538 to $853,538. Number two, amend recommendation 2B to read, authorize the general manager of LAHD or designee to, refute, to review, approve, negotiate, and execute new loan agreements or amendments to existing loan agreements for each project that receives a loan increase from this program, subject to the review and approval of an administrative oversight committee comprised of the CAO, the CLA, and the deputy mayor for housing, and then subject to review and approval of the city attorney as to form. Um, and number three, instruct the LAHD to report back to the mayor and council on the results of the loan program upon implementation, including the number of loan increases approved, the amount of each loan increase, and the projects that were awarded increased loans. Um, and uh, in addition to the supplemental report, there are um, two attachments to be included in the council file. Okay, and in terms of the last recommendation that you read, uh, report back to the mayor and council, do you have a frequency on which you're planning to report back? Or is it just at the end of the program? Um, I would believe that it, we don't have a frequency at this time. It depends upon how frequently we use the program. Okay. Um, well, we can discuss that when it comes. All right, so with those amendments uh, being made available, let's move on to um, public comment. So I'm gonna take public comment on all items on today's agenda. Uh, I wanna confirm that we have an interpreter available for commenters if we need it. That is correct, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, and we have a city attorney here to provide us with instructions to the public uh, as they prepare to call in. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members of the public who would like to provide public comment, when it is your turn to speak, please state your name and which of the agenda items you would like to speak on. You have one minute to speak on one agenda item or two minutes to speak on two or more items. In addition, those who would like to address the committee with general public comment will be provided one additional minute for a maximum up to three minutes per person for all agenda items, including general public comment. We will inform you when your time is up when speaking on the agenda items, please be on topic. Our goal is to get through as many speakers as we can. If you're not speaking on topic, or if I cannot tell whether you're speaking on an agenda item, I will give you one brief warning. If you continue to be off topic, we'll forfeit the rest of your time, and we will move on to the next speaker. Thank you, Mr. Leung. Uh, and Mr. Verano, can you please provide instructions for people to call in, call in today? Yes, Madam Chair. Members of the public who would like to offer public comment on the items listed on the agenda should call 1-669-254-5252 and use meeting ID number 160-807-0689 and then press pound. Press pound again when prompted for participant ID. Once admitted into the meeting, press star 9 to request to speak. Thank you. Ahora las instrucciones en español. Los miembros del público que deseen ofrecer comentarios públicos sobre los puntos enumerados en la agenda deben llamar al 
2545252 y usar el número de identificación de la reunión 160-807-0689, luego presionar numeral. Presionar numeral nuevamente cuando se le solicite la identificación del participante. Una vez admitido en la reunión, presione asterisco 9 para solicitar hablar. Cuando sea su turno de hablar, una voz automática en Zoom le pedirá que presione asterisco 6 para poder abrir el micrófono. Muchísimas gracias por su cooperación. Ok, thank you. And I want to just say we have quite a number of callers on the queue and I want to allow for public comment until um, 3 o'clock at the latest. So, um, let's move on. Uh, and I think we're ready to take public comment. Perfect, give me a second. Hi, please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. Sí, uh, quiero el comentario público en apoyo del artículo 18, 18 de derechos a un abogado. Ok, entonces quiere dar um, comentario público y también sobre un uno de los items de la agenda. So serían un sí, minuto de, para... derecho a un abogado. Ok, sería un minuto para el comentario público y un minuto para el item. Uh, serían dos minutos y tenemos una traduc translator. Uh, Ay, disculpen con mi español. En línea también, ok. Tiene dos minutos. Ok. Estoy listo. Ok. Puede comenzar. Hola, mi... Ok, sorry, disculpe. I just wanted to say one thing before uh, we allow this public commenter to speak. I realized I skipped one of the items in the description of the items. Item seven is related to the establishment of the right to counsel ordinance and program utilizing funding from the United to House LA ballot measure. So that will also be on today's agenda. Thank you. Go ahead. Hola, mi nombre. Hola, mi nombre es. Alonso, soy miembro de ACID. Hi, my name is Alonso. I'm a member of ACID. Y vivo en el Distrito 9. Quiero I'm, agradecer. I'm living in District 9 and I want to say thank you. A los concejales Raymond y Nuncio por presentar. And I want to say thank you to the council members Greenman and Nuncio to present. La emoción para establecer el derecho a un abogado. The motion to, in order to have the right to have an attorney. Como inquilino quiero pedir a, que apoye a un, una ordenanza. As a tenant, I uh, would like to ask if you can support an order sobre el derecho a un abogado. So we can have the right to have an attorney. Nadie debe de ser nunca desalojado sin representación legal. No one needs to be requested to be out of that property without having an attorney. Una situación que me pasó a mí, tuve que endeudarme, pedir prestado, Um, something that happened to me is that I got into debt. Um, I was requesting $5,000 as a loan. Y no me ha ayudado para nada el abogado. And the attorney has not helped me at all. Y como para los criminales si hay ayuda y para los inquilinos en la situación que estoy yo tenemos que And me tengo que endeudar y tengo que pedir prestado para poder pagar a un abogado. ¿Y, y, y por qué no, y no hay derecho? La gente, ¿qué es lo que pasa? Resulta en las calles. And how is that possible that for criminals there is help, there is assistance from an attorney? And I cannot believe that in this tenant situation that we need to get into debt um, asking a loan in order to be able to pay an attorney. So there are no rights there. And all of this ended up, you know, this person's just be on the streets. No más eso, hay niños. Y estamos en una situación que no más aumentan los dueños que están aumentando y aumentan la renta. And 
some children are included in this and the situation that we are facing currently is that the owner is just increasing and increasing the rent. Por Thank favor, you. tome conciencia, tome conciencia, por favor. Please take this into consideration. Thank you, caller. Gracias. Gracias, gracias. Hello. Hi, please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. Yes, my name is Hassan. Uh, I'm a member. I would like to speak on public comment and item number eight. Thank you. You have one minute for the item and one minute for general comment. So two I, two minutes in total. Please begin. Well, yes, definitely. Um, well, I would like to begin saying that I'm a constituent for District 14 for almost now four years. Um, I'm also an organizer with ACE, uh, besides being a tenant, and myself, where I live in uh, Six and Spring, I've been helping and dealing with uh, my own neighbors, that because a big corporation, you know, named STI and Laguna, uh, founders of this building where I live, they had tried to evict as many as they can of middle class people in the District 14. Um, and one way they're able to win is because most of these uh, neighbors or mine don't have a right to contact. So fortunately, a lot of them voluntarily left out these buildings. And the ones that are staying with uh, us to organize and fight for our rights for false allegations of owning rent um, were yet, you know, in the, in the um, situ situation where if we do get an eviction notice, we're in danger of being evicted. Uh, for not having a lawyer. Uh, even if, you know, stay house is a program where we gone and got informed and educated, it's just not enough. Um, there's a lot of stuff at the core that an individual, how smart it is, depending on degree, they cannot defend themselves. Um, it's not the same of a person that goes to law school and, and housing and is able to, to, you know, maneuver and able to, to strategize a case. Uh, and this is important. Um, I think, you know, Alonso made it a good point. A lot of the people that I know, rather than put, you know, themselves in another area, they're going to double charge the rent. They're rather to put themselves in debt and fight where they're staying because besides their families, um, their, you know, entire life has been, been there for many years um, and they don't want to move because they don't believe that they should be evicted. In some cases, some corporate landlords are using this as a tactic by sending eviction notices that are fragile and, and on our and on a Thank you, Father. That was two minutes. Hi, please state your name of the items you wish to speak on. Fred Sutton, item seven eleven in general public comment. Thank you. You have two minutes in total for the items and one minute for general comments. So three minutes in total. Please begin. Hello, honorable committee members. Uh, Fred Sutton speaking on behalf of the California, California Apartment Association. Our members help out Los Angeles. There are better solutions and uses for available dollars than what is being directed in item seven. Understanding the city is currently bound by ULA on this issue. We respectfully request the California Apartment Association is included in the report back process for engagement. These dollars must be safeguarded to ensure there is not abuse. Housing providers are not in the eviction business. Unfortunately, the eviction process is a necessary tool for rental operators as it is the only legal remedy to regain possession of a unit when a resident is not compensating the provider or the resident is not adhering to the contract. While the funding concept is laudable, we have seen abuse when it comes to dollars used for these purposes. With existing funding, unethical attorneys have made false claims about property owners who are simply trying to lawfully regain possession. Some, some firms that receive funding automatically and consistently utilize the judicial process specifically to delay cases and drive up legal fees as a tactic to force the operator to drop the case because they cannot afford the mounting costs. Higher legal expenses means higher operational costs, which means higher rent. 
we need to ensure taxpayer funds are not used to hinder lawful and valid eviction proceedings. Again, we request to be included in a stakeholder feedback session so we can detail what our members experience for consideration. As relates to item uh, uh, 11, uh, we urge support of the item and thank the council members for bringing this forward. We also continue to encourage the city to explore a permanent emergency rental subsidy program to help those most in need. Direct rental assistance is the most effective way to achieve the city's aim of helping those facing temporary economic hardship. Thank you very much. Thank you, caller. Caller with the last, oh, thank you. Uh, your name that I don't wish to speak on. Um, yes, good afternoon. My name is Pablo Estupinian. I'm the campaign director for Right to Council, and I'd like to speak on item seven, the general comments. Thank you. You have one minute for the item and one minute for general comments, so two minutes in total. Please begin. All right, sorry, one second. I was just finishing a snack. Uh, so good afternoon. I want to thank um, Council Member Brahman for their leadership in Right to Council, as well as Council Member Bumsfield for working together to introduce a critical motion to establish uh, Right to Council. Um, the truth is we are in an eviction crisis even with COVID-19 protections, landlords still filed almost 35,000 eviction cases in LA County last year in 2022. We expect that to rise. This year will be worse. Um, and there is no doubt that homelessness will rise. And so uh, our organization, Sage, at our weekly kind of action clinic, we've already been seeing a rise in the number of tenants that come every week with unlawful detainers. Uh, sadly, there's little we can do uh, to support them. Um, we can educate them about the court process, but unfortunately we can't connect them to a lawyer. And that is, um, you know, due to the fact that they house delay, um, while it's been successful in its establishment in the pandemic, to reach out to hundreds of thousands of tenants about their rights, COVID protections, and more. Um, the reality is the program is currently funded to represent about 1,100 uh, families a year, which as you can see clearly falls short of the actual need uh, so I do want to recognize that the speaker before me uh, from the apartment association, I think they just said the tenants do not deserve due process in court. And so as other folks have highlighted, it is super critical for tenants to have legal representation in court. That is unfair. There is no equity uh, when a tenant is going face against a skilled landlord attorney who is in the business of eviction, of evicting people because that is what they signed up to do and that is what their job is, to evict people. Um, and so when we, we can look at right to counsel through different perspectives about court equity, increasing access to folks uh, who are low income, and let's be real and um, acknowledge that the folks who are going to be homeless are mostly going to be black people of color, low income, who will be displaced, and homelessness will rise if folks don't have uh, access to legal representation. And uh, lastly, I just want to say there's also cost savings. So. Uh, there is research um, that we have done in the Right to Council Coalition here in Los Angeles that demonstrates that the city would save a dollar for every, uh, sorry, would save three dollars and forty eight cents for every dollar invested in Right to Council uh, because there will be uh, reductions in homelessness, the cost of sheltering someone, incarcerating, policing them, thank, sweeping the encampments. Thank you, Paula. Um, sorry, if didn't make to cut you off. That was two minutes. Um, Hi, please state your name and the items you're to speak on. Good afternoon. This is Ms. Foster, and I'd like to speak on 4, 7, and 11. Thank you. You have two minutes in total. And, for and, general, and general comments, please. Um, so you have two minutes in total for the items and one minute for general comments, so three minutes in total. Please begin. Okay, so quickly, just for number four, um, it says that you're going to be trying to increase the medium income for Proposition HHH. Please do give us full details on there, because on that, I, I, perhaps you're going to be having a presentation, I don't know, but it's kind of vague on this agenda sheet, so we really don't know what's going on there. Um, um, in relation to item number seven, uh, the right to counsel, um, First of all, Mr. Sutton did not say that um, tenants did not have a right to due process. 
so the call, previous caller was not listening. That was not what he said. But I, I do want to say that if you're going to do a right to counsel for tenants, you also need to include small business landlords because Contrary to belief, not every landlord has a corporate legal budget, and we're not all corporate America. Uh, there's a lot of small business landlords who uh, are self-represented. So if someone's going to be self-represented as a landlord because they can't afford to go get a loan and get an attorney, then they too should be included in it. There should be some, some balance in here, you, you know, working towards the same goal of, of supporting small business landlords as well as tenants that need help. I mean, you just can't, because otherwise you're just gonna have a shift in the opposite direction of, of, of imbalance. And there are uh, a lot of attorneys out there that use this and drive up attorney fees uh, to, um, at, I mean, doing full-blown litigation, you know, interrogatories, the demand for production of documents and just running up fees to, to just choke landlords that really can't afford to, to, to hire an attorney for themselves. Um, uh, also, uh, an item number 11, small housing providers. I think that uh, in your concept or your definition of small housing providers, that should not be limited to, to mom and pop. Um, again, we need to make a distinction between small business landlords and um, corporate. You know, there's a difference between five, 10 units landlord versus someone that has 100 units or 500. The moment you go past four units, you lump us all in together. And there's a big difference. So you need to get rid of the notion of just simply mom and pop, but thinking more in terms of small business landlords the same way you think of small businesses versus Amazon, big corporate America. There truly is a, is, is a difference. Uh, and for my public comment, I'd like to say that two weeks ago, Ms. Rahman, I called in and uh, you gave assurances that the committee would contact me and you did not. All this time, you have not contacted me. I would like to just say that you did have someone contact me, so you get points for having someone contact me. Unfortunately, your, your assistant said that she was not equipped to, on the subject matter and that it was better suited by the deputy who never contacted me, but I really would like to have a sit down with the committee as a landlord that actually works with all of these different programs and, you know, PATH, Volunteers of America, Hopix, all of these, uh, uh, you know, programs and these agencies. You need to be, you know, getting feedback from both sides. And I also work with Hagla and uh, LACTA and Thank you, caller. That was three minutes. Ms. Mr. Harris Dawson, did you have a? Thank you, uh, if caller. If you don't mind, uh, if we could ask uh, Councilwoman Raman to pass along your information, we'd love the opportunity to be able to sit with you. Yes, and we yeah we have reached out to Ms. Foster. We heard about the policy. Um, we 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 hear you on the distinction you're making between mom and pop and non-corporate but smaller landlords and are eager to learn more and we'll continue to engage with you and happy to pass your information on to other committee members thank you let's move on to the next caller please state your name and the items you wish to speak on barbara schultz item seven and general comments Thank you. You have one minute for the item and one for general comments. So two in total, please begin. Thank you. Uh, my name is Barbara Schultz. I'm the Director of Housing Justice at Legal Aid Foundation of Los Angeles and also oversee Stay House LA. Um, I'm uh, here to urge you to support uh, item number seven. Informed represented tenants achieve better outcomes and are far less likely to become unhoused as a result of eviction. Stay House LA, which is presently funded by the city of LA to represent about 150 evictions a month. Um, but in December, there were 3,414 UDs filed, approximately half of which are likely city of LA. So that's about 1,700 cases. And this was before the COVID protections were rescinded. Um, so you can see the need that is out there and that is only going to grow. This is why we need to begin phasing in a true right to counsel as soon as possible. I also just wanted to assure the EGLA speaker that Stay House LA is staffed 
by ethical attorneys. Um, and if any council members uh, wish to meet separately with anyone from the Right to Counsel Coalition, we'd be happy to do so. Thank you for your support. Thank you. Hi, please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. Uh, hi, my name is Abby King and I was hoping to speak on agenda item number seven and general public comment. Thank you. You have one minute for the item and one minute for general comment, so two minutes in total. Please begin. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. My name is Abby King and I am a legislative affairs manager with BICA, the Valley Industry and Commerce Association. BICA was an opponent of the 2022 ballot measure ULA, a measure that will impose new tax and labor requirements on private and commercial properties valued above $5 million. We believe that this measure will discourage developers from investing in Los Angeles and result in an increase to the cost to build affordable housing. Although this measure was passed by only 58% of the voters this past November, the City of Los Angeles is facing a lawsuit to overturn Measure ULA because it did not garner the two-thirds required by law. As we await the verdict of this lawsuit, BICA urges the City Council to consider the importance of stakeholder engagement throughout the process of developing and implementing ULA-funded programs. We understand that a, position of ULA fund a portion of ULA funding must be used to establish a right to council program. However, we want to emphasize that an increase in lengthy, expensive lawsuits is not beneficial to renters or property owners. For these reasons, we hope you will prioritize engagement with local stakeholders and property owners to ensure that guardrails are put in place throughout this process to protect not just renters, but also property owners. Over the past two years, property owners have dealt with well-intended renter, renter protection policies that ended up being abused, resulting in months, if not years, of lost income. We must work together to ensure that future policies are beneficial to all Los Angeles residents. Thank you. Thank you, caller. Hi, can you please state your name Hello? that you wish to speak on? Sí. Uh, ¿Ocupa sí. tu traducción? Sí, ocupo Trans traducción. Translator, can you translate, yeah. sir? Thank you. Yeah, I can definitely can. Uh -huh. um, sí. ah, please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. Por favor, indíquenos sí. su nombre y también de los incisos de los cuales usted quiere hablar. Sí, mi nombre es Sofía Mendoza, soy miembro de ACE y vivo en el Distrito 9. So, my name is Rosia Mendoza, a member of AC, and I'm living in District 9. Sí, y quiero hablar sobre el artículo 18 y comentario público. And I want to talk about the article 18 and also public comment. Thank you. You have one minute for the item and one minute for public comment, so two minutes in total. Please begin. Muy bien, tiene dos minutos en total. Puede comenzar. Sí, quiero agradecer a los concejales Raman y Rubente. I want to say thank you to the council members Raman and Rubente. Por presentar la moción para establecer el derecho a un abogado. To present the motion in order for us to have the right to have an attorney. Como inquilino, quiero pedir que apoye un la ordenanza. And as a tenant, I'm here to ask your support to support the order. Sobre el derecho a un abogado. To have the right in order to have an attorney. Ah, ah, nunca un inquilino debe de ah, quedarse sin tener representación legal. A tenant should not be without legal representation. Sí, ya que muchos inquilinos estamos siendo desalojados y demandados por los dueños. Because a lot of us, a lot of the tenants, uh, we are being putting some lawsuits on us because of this. Sí, el 98% de los inquilinos que no tiene representación legal pierden a um, su, o sea, pierden el caso. And the 98% of all the tenants without legal representation, they just ended up losing the case. 
Sí, ya que hay mucha gente en la calle, queremos que nos apoyen en esa ordenanza para que no haya tantas personas en la calle. And also take into consideration that there, there are many, many people in the streets. We are just here asking you your support of this order. Yo soy una persona que está siendo desalojada y la verdad yo no quisiera estar en la calle. Tengo tres hijos y, y dos muchachos con necesidades especiales. And I am a person that I'm being requested to move out and I don't want to be on the streets. Um, I have three sons and two persons that they have special needs. Por eso les pido que se toquen el corazón y nos apoyen. Gracias. And is what I'm asking your support. Thank you. Thank you, gracias. Hi, please state your name and the items you're to speak on. Hi, my name is Heidi Gonzalez. Um, item seven in general comment, please. Thank you. You have one minute for the item and one minute for general comments, so two minutes in total. Please begin. Okay. Uh, my name is Heidi Gonzalez, um, and I'm a tenant in Los Angeles, along with my two-year-old daughter, Sarita. In 2021, I received the unlawful detention summons. It was a package of 10 to 15 pages. It was on a Friday, and I only had five days to file my answer or I will automatically lose my case. It was very stressful to find a lawyer over the weekend, but thanks to the program State House LA, I got a lawyer. But now, due to the increase of the eviction cases, State House LA is not taking more cases. As an organizer with HIV, it's very sad to tell the families that we can't help them because we don't have lawyers. Usually these families are low-income families. Um, so this is why it's very important to have the right to counsel. As a renter, I want to strongly urge you to support a right to counsel ordinance. No one should ever be evicted without legal representation. Um, as my public comment, I would like to um, ask um, counsel Heather Hutt to contact me um, because I need help. Um, I'm going through an eviction for over a year and a half and I'm still dealing with my landlord, who is a nasty landlord that has been, um, uh, he has been violated all my tenant rights and human rights. So I, I need help. Um, so please, uh, Council Heather Hart, um, contact me. You have my information already. Thank you. Thank you, caller. Hi, please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. Peggy Lee Kennedy, agenda item number nine, number 10, and general public comment. Thank you, you have two minutes in total for the items and one minute for general comments, so three minutes in total, please begin. I uh, Initially, I wanna applaud the uh, motion to that uh, council person. Uh, Raman made to identify and secure the appropriate shelter, create incentive, incentives to relinquish RVs, uh, securing short-term storage, uh, standing fit parking, and uh, leveraging case management. And that's great. Um, and then uh, the CAO report does uh, seem to try and create a budget for those things. But the problem is nested in that report is their procedures, their procedures, which are harmful and inappropriate because uh, I, I have witnessed the fact that they have, number one on their procedure list is homeless outreach and services that do not exist. They do not exist. And so you're approving this stick no carrot procedure nested in that report where the first thing they really do, if they have an outreach person there, it's a facade because the, the services are not in place yet. So 
um, the first thing they do is come with sweets, picketing, um, and the law enforcement, and uh, you know, Boeing, and <laughs> then they put up some signs, right, so that you can't go back. So, I mean, it's nested in the report. You can't approve that, uh, you know, morally before you, uh, you know, have it in place for your program. That's not what your motion asked for, Councilperson Raman. So, I mean, if we have to, I would say it would be much more wise to go onto the pilot program as the funding comes in to use um, the pilot that um, mentioned in um, agenda item 10. That to me seems more prudent as you get the funding so that you're not just wiping these people out because that's basically what's happening out here. It's about uh, harm and not the service that you are intending citywide. And as a general public comment, I want to say that if there's any way this committee could look into strategies of creating more public housing, that's what we really need, social and public housing and supporting those efforts. And I hope that you've listened to my public comment. Thank you very much. Thank you, caller. Caller with the last four digits, 8227. Please press star six to unmute. Um, translator, can you possibly repeat that in Spanish? So sure, call, no I'll repeat it and then you can translate it. Caller with the last four digits, 8227. Please press star six to unmute. Muy bien, entonces la persona que está llamando con el número de teléfono oh, que termina en 82. No, I speak English. I speak English. Okay. Sorry, I kept getting pound six. My name is Lena Gomes. I'd like to speak on um, item seven and general comments. Thank you. You have one minute for the item and one minute for general comment. Thank you, translator, and please begin, caller. Okay, great. I'm a member of eight. I want to thank Councilors Blumenberg and Rahman. Thanks for representing this motion to establish a right to counsel. An eviction is a legal procedure. Therefore, tenants should have access to representation so they can exercise their right to equal protection under the law as a remedy to overcome illegal and unfair evictions. Studies have shown that when tenants have legal counsel, they're more likely to get a fair chance at the eviction proceeding. Yet less than 10% of tenants usually have legal representation. Tenants who have legal counsel are also more likely to stay housed, to keep their jobs, and to keep their children in school. This is not an us versus them issue. It's an issue of tenant protection to avoid further calamity of evictions in Los Angeles. Everybody, regardless of their socioeconomic background or racial and linguistic affiliation, should have access to an attorney and equal protection under the law. This ordinance to establish a right to counsel is sensible. It's a sensible step in tenant protection given the disastrous climate of illegal evictions in our city. Our streets are filled with tents. Cars and vans are loaded with families seeking shelter after illegal and unfair evictions. People should not be become, people should not become blight in the city. Tenants are human beings. This can't continue to be the status quo of our city. I urge each of you on this committee to reevaluate your commitment to the tenants and the citizens in this city. We urge you to unequivocally support the ordinance for the right to counsel. Thank you very much for your time and your service. Thank you, caller. Please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. 
Hi, my name is Maria Lopez. Um, item seven and general public comment. Thank you. You have one minute for the item and one minute for general comment. The two minutes in total. Please begin. Good afternoon, council members and committee members. Uh, my name is Maria Lopez. I'm undocumented, unafraid, and unapologetic. I am also the coordinator for the Keep LA House Coalition and our team, Keep LA House. I am in tremendous support of item seven and its totality and advocate for a full tenant bill of rights for all LA city tenants. Uh, thank you again to Councilmember Raman and Blumenfield for introducing the motion to establish a right to counsel. As a renter who's gone through an eviction in court for asking for removal of bed bugs, I want to urge you all to support this. No one should ever be evicted without legal representation. Uh, tenant rights, eviction protection, landlord duties and obligations must often be enforced in court involving complex legal paperwork and procedures. Without an attorney to assist the tenant, access to justice is limited by difficulty of navigating the court system. A right to a defense is a right that makes all the other rights real. In short, right to counsel is about reducing homelessness and access to equity and, and justice in court. An eviction case will never be equitable if a landlord, if landlords are in the 90 percentile of being represented and less than 10 percent of tenants uh, receive legal representation. Pass item seven and let's keep LA house. Thank you. Thank you, caller. Caller with the last four digits, one, five, six, six, please press star six to unmute. Lo hace yo. No me escucha, Vicky. Hello. Hi, please say your name in the item. Hello. Por favor, diga su nombre también en los ejercicios que quiere hablar. Buenas tardes, mi nombre es Victoria Enrique, soy miembro de EIS, vivo en el distrito nueve. Y yo quiero que apoyen la formación de los préstamos, este, un abogado para los inquilinos. Yo soy vendedor ambulante, yo soy sola, yo tengo un nieto que es huérfano. Y pues que nos ayuden, tenemos que, que nos defienda un abogado. Es lo que les pedimos, por favor. Y, este, y quería traductor también. Good afternoon, my name is Victoria Enriquez. I'm part of the AC, I am living in District 9, and I'm here to talk about the ordinance in order to have um, an attorney. We as a tenants, we really need this. We really need to have legal representation. Um, I'm just a vendor, you know, I'm completely alone. I do have a grandson. Um, he doesn't have his parents currently, and yeah, we totally need the legal representation. That's what, I'm, what, what we are asking. Y tenemos, tenemos que tener un, quien nos, nos, este, nos representa en las cortes cuando nos demandan los dueños. Pónganse la mano en el corazón, que todos llegamos iguales. Todos llegamos por indocumentados, después ya arregla uno sus papeles. Pero inclusivemente así todos llegamos a pagar renta, no porque ya tengan sus casas los dueños. And yeah, we need to have um, representation on court. Um, also, I'm asking this to touch the bottom of your heart in order for um, receive your support and your help. Um, you know, all of us, we are the same. We are equal. Um, at the very beginning of our lives here in this country, we are undocumented. And throughout the time, we can just get ready um, or paperwork. So at the very beginning, we are paying the rent and all of that. So yeah, we really need this legal representation on court. Thank you, caller. That was two minutes. Muy bien, gracias. Ya fueron sus dos minutos. Caller with the last four digits, 9751, please press star six to unmute. Can we translate that as well? Oh, they unmuted. Okay. Thank 
Please, please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. Uh, my name is Carl Morgan. I'd like to speak on item seven. Thank you. You have one minute for the item. Please begin. Oh, I'm sorry. And general comment. Okay, so you have two minutes in total. Please begin. Good afternoon. I am part of a working group that represents over 50 black and brown housing providers in South Los Angeles. It's the Local Rental Owners Collective, and we are funded by the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative and the Roy and Patricia Disney Family Foundation. I strongly advise the commission to reject funding for private attorneys to represent tenants in eviction cases. LA already has dozens of existing mediation, mediation organizations to rectify disputes between tenants and housing providers. Here's a simple solution to the problem you are trying to solve. Give that $34 million to the existing organization to, to pay the tenants' rent directly in arrears or pay for the needed repairs for habitability. Why give taxpayer dollars to lawyers that will only double dip in the process by getting paid for their services and also getting a cut of the tenant's settlement? The least you can do, or please think about this, do not allow the lawyers to take a percentage of the tenant's money. Prevent the double dipping that exists today in that crazy system for providing lawyers for tenants. If you're going to provide lawyers for tenants, ban them from taking a percentage of the tenant's money. Just give the money directly to the tenant. Direct rental assistance to tenants is what's needed to keep Angelinos housed and not funding for shady lawyers that are taking advantage of tenants and housing providers and further driving up rent. People are literally dying to get into this country, and I'm quite sure none of their goals was to live in an apartment. LA City Council needs to stop being racist against black, brown and black people who are housing providers. Stop making it illegal to be middle class and, and, and fund great programs like down payment assistance, helping, helping out with better loan terms for home buyers. And finally, make it feasible for poor and working. Thank you, caller. That was two minutes. And now this will be our last caller. The next okay. caller. Hi, please state your name and the items you're supposed to Hello, good, mo uh, good afternoon. My name is Daniel Jimenez, and I'd like to speak on item seven. Thank you. You have, you have one minute for the item. Please begin. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Daniel Jimenez. I'm a, a, a director of community organizing with the inner city struggle and a member of the Keep LA Health Coalition. I am here today to support uh, the motion to write to council. Um, our community has been deeply impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic and is um, it's a struggling to pay for basic needs, right? And we don't, um, we don't foresee that they can actually uh, be able to afford a, a lawyer once they, um, they uh, start an eviction, an eviction case. Not only that, but um, only 10%, uh, less than 10% of the, um, of the tenants now have legal representation, but more than 80, uh, 98% that don't have those representation lose their cases in eviction court. Um, we know that tenant protections work. We know that um, tenant protections keep people housed, and that is why we need to pass a uh, right to counsel. It is so important that our community is protected and our community has the, uh, the tools necessary for them to fight, to fight back for their, uh, for their dwelling. Uh, once again, I wanna thank uh, Council uh, uh, Nithya Raman and Bloomingfield for their support, but also encourage them to um, uh, you know, fight uh, for more protections at the county, uh, at, the, at the LA city, right? We have a tenant bill of rights uh, that we have been Push, uh, pushing forward, and that includes right to counsel, but it includes a, a lot of other protections that have not been implemented in LA City. So thank you for your time. Thank you, caller. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, that was 45 minutes of public comment. So I think we can conclude our public comment for today. I want to thank every single person who called in for sharing your thoughts. We always value your input, um, and thank you for your continued engagement with the work of this committee. I want to recommend um, that we take the following items on consent. Uh, one, three, four, five, seven, and 11, unless there are any objections to any of those. One, three, four, 
five, seven, and 11. Item two is gonna be continued, so we're not voting on that today. Um, and uh, I just wanted to emphasize a couple of points, so that'll give you a moment if you wanna um, raise an objection to any of these moving on consent. For item four, I did wanna say that this AMI increase is only gonna to apply to projects serving veterans because uh, they have a higher um, voucher, they, have, they get higher levels of benefits, and the, so basically 100% service-connected veterans are inadvertently penalized and excluded from units that are intended to serve them. Um, and this AMI increase should not apply to any other affordable housing projects and we don't want it to. Um, and I, I don't wanna risk potentially including some of the poorest people in our city from being able to access the housing that's being built here, but for veterans who are receiving benefits through VASH um, and through the, um, through the VA, I wanna make sure that they're able to uh, access the units that are being built specifically for them. So um, I, there were some questions that came in in advance on that. Um, and yes, Mr. Lee. Mr. Lee. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I just have a couple questions on item seven. So if we can keep that. Yep, we can do that. Okay, and then um, one more comment I had on item 11, if people are moving uh, comfortable with it moving forward on consent as well. I'm really excited to see this. Thank you, Councilmember Blumenfield and others who presented this. Um, it dovetails very nicely with a motion that I introduced back in January about recommendations for a new relief assistance program for smaller landlords. Um, and I know the department is working on it, so I'm hoping that when they do report back that they'll be able to respond to both of these motions. Councilmember Bloomfield, did you wanna add anything at this time on this motion? No, I mean, uh, thank you. I'm happy to take it on consent. Um, I think that uh, some of it can be through a financial assistance program. The county has a program for providing assistance. Um, so we'll, we'll sort that out and uh, glad that we're moving it forward. Okay, fantastic. So the items that we're going to be moving forward on con consent now are one, three, four, five, and 11. And if everyone's comfortable, uh, we can, uh, Mr. Verano, can you please call the roll? Councilmember Rahman. Yes. Councilmember Blumenfield. Aye. Councilmember Harris Dawson. Councilmember Harris Dawson. Councilmember Harris Dawson is absent. Councilmember Rodriguez. Aye. Councilmember Lee. Aye. Four ayes, and these items are approved. Great. Thank you. So um, let's start. Let's start with item six. Item number six is a Los Angeles Housing Department report relative to improving evaluation processes, contract procedures, and timely payments between the city and the Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority and related matters. Okay, and we have a rep here from the Housing Department to talk about this report. Um, and I think this report is really designed uh, to be responsive to some of the challenges that our housing providers, our service providers are facing, uh, despite the hard work, um, at LAHD, LASA, and this council, the end result of our current contracting processes is that it takes a very long time for service providers to get paid for their work. We've heard that directly from them. They're carrying a lot of those costs um, and most of them don't have access to a huge line of credit. And so uh, the recommendations in this report are really gonna help streamline some of the, are designed to help streamline some of the funding categories and the data reporting to align contracts with the city's policies, um, require LASA to invoice the city more consistently, make grievance processes more straightforward, um, and potentially uh, increasing the administrative rate, although that's not guaranteed, it's just gonna look into it. Um, and so these are the kinds of things it's looking at, and we have the housing department here to present on this. Um, I'm happy to begin, but I do see the council member's hand is oh, raised. Council member Rodriguez, you wanted to speak on this item before the presentation? No, I can hear the presentation, but I, I just have some comments. So go ahead. Great. Um, so thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Ana Gomez, and I serve as the new Assistant Chief Grants Administrator for the Los Angeles Housing Department's Homeless Services Unit. Uh, I'm joined today by my colleague, Hannah Livian, 
who previously served in this position and authored the report that you have before you. We are also currently joined by LASA's CFO, Christina Dixon, um, who will be available to answer any questions for LASA. So the transmittal before you was provided in response to the council motion dated January 2022, which directed LAHD to work um, with the assistance of CLA, the CAO, and city attorney to evaluate the city's contracting procedures with LASA, report on ways to ensure timely payments to providers, and improving uh, contract oversight. In addition, LAHD conducted stakeholder interviews with service providers subcontracted by LASA. Through those conversations, the recommendations provided outline ways to maximize staff time by standardizing processes that will result in quicker processing of invoicing and execution of subrecipient contracts, ensure greater accountability for the work to be conducted by these subcontractors, and improve communications and alignment among city departments, LASA, and subrecipients. Lastly, I would like to note that the revised report um, provided removes recommendation A from the original transmittal provided in May 2022. With that, we are available to discuss any recommendations in further detail and answer any questions. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I wanted to just ask one question before I throw it open to the committee. Can you talk a little bit about the contracts timeline that you follow now? and how you're proposing to change it. Uh, I'd love to hear uh, the changes in a little bit more detail and how you envision them actually being implemented. Sure, so I, I can I could begin here and I think Anne and, and Hannah, if you wanna add anything in terms of this. Um, so in, in the transmittal, you'll see that there is um, a timeline that's provided in terms of how um, the, process is, the process begins. So generally we, um, compile all of the various reports or actions that are taken by the committee and then we initiate the contracting process to draft amendments. So generally, you'll see in the timeline that it's, gener it's upon execution of the contracts that LASA can then move forward with executing their own subrecipient agreements. So one of the recommendations provided um, essentially formalizes a recommendation to allow LASA to begin um, negotiating and and drafting subrecipient contracts from the beginning uh, of the of the contracting process, and so this would essentially um, streamline the process and ensure that that there's almost a parallel process that's moving forward, both within the city to loss of contracts and the subrecipient contracts. And I don't know, Hannah, if there's anything here that you'd like to add. And to effectuate this change, you need the city to make changes on its, its end to allow LASA to do this, or will this require additional changes from LASA in order for those new contracts to be provided? So the recommendation, my understanding is that, um, and and um, I think LASA can also speak to this, is that LASA has already begun piloting this, um, but has not formalized the implementation. and so. The direction before um, before LASA would formalize this structure to ensure that they're doing it on, on a consistent basis. And that requires action from the city in order to have them make that change? That's, um, that's the recommendation that we have, yes, before you. And it doesn't require action on the part of LASA in order to effectuate this change? Like they don't have to make changes in their rules, it's because of our rules that they're doing it in this sequential way rather than in a um, simultaneous fashion? I don't know, Christina, if you can speak a little bit more to the details of um, the contracting procedures at LASA. Good afternoon, council members. I apologize for my video. I'm actually at a conference and my, the lighting in my room is not very good. So I apologize if you can't see me very well. Um, just so I, I want to make sure I understand the question. Are you asking if having the, um, more, the greater flexibility in the contract that LASA has with the city will enable us to be more flexible in our contracting with our subrecipients? No, this was a recommendation that's made specifically about um, sequential, uh, providing for simultaneous contracts as opposed to sequential contracting. So us changing our contract with LASA and then LASA goes out to change the contract with their subrecipients. And the recommendation here is that both of those two things happen at the same time, that as we are amending our contract with LASA to include any new um, requests or funding, that contract that LASA is at the same time going out to those subrecipients and negotiating the contract. I was just 
wondering whether that require why would that require city action in order to effectuate that so the the reason why the city action is required is because lhasa receives its money from the city so if there's a delay in lhasa getting its funder agreement from the city it delays our ability to execute the contracts with our providers so we have to have per our council we have to have an executed funder agreement with the city in order to execute contracts with the agency so what we're trying to do is make sure that we have a, an agreement that is multi-year or that doesn't have to be re up every single year because we have multi-year agreements with our agencies so when we had some conversations with agencies one of the things that they said was every year having to go back and have a new contract re up prevents them from being able to get their advances or to be able to move forward with us being able to reimburse them so we wanted to move to something similar to what we have with the county where we have an operating agreement that is multi-year but we get an annual allocation okay so i i think that these are not speaking to my specific question but why don't we move on to other questions and perhaps we can come back to this councilmember rodriguez thank you um you know i, I i've dealt with a lot of procurement issues in my tenure both uh, on the board of public works and then also as a council member and you know one of the challenges and i know christina this has been one of the conversations even when we talked about the administrative fees and the cost of managing this we are providing the administrative burden for you to not only administer these contracts uh, but to also go through the there it's just so multi-layered um whether it's you doing it or the city of los angeles doing it we're terrible at paying people on time that is just across the board uh, our, our procurement processes are antiquated, but we also need to assure contract compliance, which is part of the obligation that you have. And so when you have uh, the processes with uh, contract compliance, uh, that by and large is probably one of the biggest hurdles, I think, uh, before you cut a check. Would that be accurate, Christina? That is correct. Okay. So, um, I guess my question is, and one of the things I always like to do, and I did this uh, when we were overhauling uh, Bavin, which is now RAMP. Um, but when we were going through the process is the workflow, and I appreciate this, this, uh, this tracking here and, and what this looks like. Um, but for me, what's most telling is how long does it sit in any one part of the queue is what I'd like to know. Where is the, where, in looking at this workflow, where is it, where is the longest wait time of this queue? So the longest wait time in the queue would be the finalization of the contract terms. So if there's any back and forth that happens and it has to go to council multiple times, then that can be what bottlenecks it. Um, what we found, however, with the piloting of the Inside Safe program is that having a coordinated effort and having constant communication, which we've really done a really good job of creating that between LHD and CAO and answering any questions up front can help streamline the process. So we have, as Anna mentioned, we have examples of how we can streamline and make this work. And we've been piloting it with projects like Inside Safe. So as a more recent example, we were able to get the funder agreement and contracts executed within a 21 day turnaround. Okay, so let me just, uh, yes. Um, so I guess I, I wanna better ascertain which um, which contracts are the ones that have presented themselves as being most, pro you know, wh where is it in the negotiated terms? Is it in the circle contracts? Uh, what, what type of contract? Because everything should be relatively standardized. You're talking in terms of the, of the, the contracts that you're administrating. Is that correct? It's more so the funder agreement. So it's the funder agreement between LASA and the city. Um, the general fund seems to be a more streamlined agreement because it's one that we've had for a while. It's the roadmap contract that has been a, a particularly challenging. Um, Inside Safe is funded out of the general fund, so that helps with the streamlining. But when there are specialty programs like roadmap that come online and each funding type or program type may have special terms or conditions, that can be and what helps, that, that creates the challenge. 
And to be clear, that's because of the source of the funds. That's correct. Oh, got it. So it's part of the added burden that comes out of the compliance that is derived or informed by uh, the source of funds. So of course, that's like anything, right? That's like it, whether it's a whether it's a grant that comes in from the feds for uh, law enforcement purposes, right? And we have to have compliance in certain things that we. Uh, that is the complication. So I guess, I, I guess you know for. Uh, I'm trying to I'm trying to ascertain. I, look, I want to I want us to get to an efficiency point with everything that we do, but there's also kind of is this a nothing burger? Is what I want to understand because I recognize that when when things are general funded, um, mm -hmm. that always makes it easier because we're just saying, hey, this is the this is the pot of city funds. Uh, we're directing it towards this uh, towards this effort. Uh, you you have far more flexibility, for example than if it was a state grant that had has certain compliance portions where you have to kind of go through the checks of every piece before you can cut a check in the end, correct? No, so the compliance usually comes on the back end. On the it's back the, end, but on the front end, in terms of negotiation. terms and conditions and the agreement around what, what will be the performance target or what will be the program design. That's typically what takes the, 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 the that causes the delay if there so isn't a consensus on that what's the source of funds for roadmaps that is adding to the level of complications roadmap was funded out of esgcb which is the federal funds um and anna helped me out because i think there's it's multiple funding sources but i believe esgcb is the largest funding source and i i believe it was more so about what what is the program type what what will be funded and because um that was directed funded each council district had you know a specialty program anytime you specialize it creates more more layers challenges. Right. yes so my but my question is is what is the eligibility of use of those funds or was that you know how did we derive that uh the work of roadmaps would be uh would utilize this source of funds when you're saying that there's added complications with the use of those funds, right, versus general funds. We've allocated, you know, we have multiple sources of funding to do the work that we've been doing on homelessness. So we can pick and choose in terms of if we're concerned about service providers on one end, right, we can either use far more flexible or far more complicated funds in order to do that work. So my question is, is that is uh, the roadmap funded work um, that is using this, and forgive me for the acronym, it's e, uh, ECHS, is that right? ESGCV. Or e, okay, thank you. Uh, there's so many acronyms here, I, I can't. Uh, but I, I just want to understand, is there, are there other sources of funds or could those funds be applied to other things that would then avail perhaps, uh, you know, some of our general funded programs to, you know what I'm saying, to swap out to facilitate more expedited uh, you know, issuance of payments and compliance. Um, so, so if I can chime in here, if it's if it's okay. Um, so, I, I think you know, I, I agree with Christina in terms of the complexity of, of the roadmap contract. I think it's definitely um, it is it is the most complex um, contract that we currently hold, and and it's because of all these various um, funding sources. And, and I don't know if, if um, the CEO's office can speak a little bit more to their process because. We generally receive the the recommendations and the instructions for the roadmap from the roadmap reports, um, and and that's where our instructions are are derived. But I also wanted to make sure that that we addressed the question brought up earlier about um, the the piece that takes the, the the longest delay. So what Christina was referencing in terms of of uh, you know metrics and um, and some of those items are are within the scope of work, and and in that sense part of the, some of the recommendations that are included in today's report um, would directly filter into that. I think part of the, the stakeholder conversations, what, and, and some of the research that went into this report highlight is that um, there is this sort of interconnectedness between the contracts themselves, but also with the, the data responsibilities, um, with the monitoring and oversight. And so there are a couple of, of recommendations that are included um, in terms of streamlining data reporting requirements, um, beginning to analyze how those also feed, uh, feed into the larger um, ECHS uh, for the city, 
um, that would, I think, go a long way in ensuring that there is a more streamlined process in terms of what's considered, um, what's sort of included within the, the scope of work, which again is, is um, probably one of the largest um, parts of the timeline. Um, but I don't know if you wanted to discuss a bit further the, the funding recommendations which are provided by, by the office of the CAO. I'm, I'm fine. Okay, thank you, Councilmember Blumenfield. Great, thank you. Uh, got a number of questions. First, has Dr. Adams Kellum taken a position on these? Um, so our, our team has not directly had a conversation um, with Dr. Adams Kellum on this. I spoke with her briefly earlier today and she supports any um, recommendation that will help streamline and make more efficient the access to funding for the providers. Great. I mean, and, and conceptually, everybody would. I just, I, I'd, I'd like her to be drilling down on some of these details as she's about to take on this this role. Uh, I, I'm trying to understand uh, if the issue, the process issue here, is this process or lack of staff? How many people on LAHD's contracting and accounting team, how many people are there and what is the vacancy rate? Uh, I'm gonna ask uh, Anna to respond to that. Um, I should know it, but not sure about the current vacancy rate. Um, so so there, are, there are three teams that work um, collectively on this. So, so there is the, the homeless services unit, which I am a part of. Um, and that includes four additional positions. My time is split between two different teams, um, but there are four additional positions that work almost exclusively on um, the work very, you know, work collectively with the contract staff, but also um, oversee the monitoring and, and performance of, of these grant agreements. Um, then we work uh, very closely with our contracts unit. There are two positions there um, that, that almost exclusively work on loss of contracts. Um, Currently, those those positions are vacant, um, but um, but we're working to fill them. And then separately, we have um, a an accountant that works exclusively on on LASA. So, two out of six are vacant. Is that what you said? Correct. Okay, so that's you know thirty three percent vacancy rate. What's how much of the delay is due to staff turnover or? lack of urgency or lack of response to the service providers on LASA's end. I know there's long delays in executing the contract, um, but I've heard from some service providers that they, they reach out to LASA and will either have to explain the situation many times to multiple people, or they just don't get a response from LASA. And then oftentimes council offices, mine including, end up intervening. And so I'm trying to get a sense of how much of this is, is really just staff turnover and, and the staffing issue. Um, so, council member, in terms of the um, some of the communication that you're receiving directly from the service providers, um, I think that's one of the recommendations that we we have before us um, is to ensure that we have direct communication with those subrecipients as well, or, or they're at least given the opportunity to um, to provide us some of that feedback. Because, as you mentioned, we generally do receive feedback uh, from a third party, and so what we're hoping to do is is ensure that we have that direct communication. Um, with with some of those service providers because we almost work work exclusively with with LASA in terms of developing the contracts and and then implementation. Um, and, and, and as far as the sub recipients, how how does LASA monitor the funding, and and will the recommend uh, for the sub recipients will the recommendation be require sub recipient service providers to do more work by requiring them to submit cost allocation plans, um, or once the cost allocation plan is submitted, who is it submitted to? Is it submitted to LASA or LAHD? How's that going to work? The subrecipient um, cost allocation plans are already required, um, and and uh, I think LASA has extensive experience with this on county contracts, and so that's that's really um, part of the conversation and negotiation that would take place between LHD and LASA. But I know I don't know, Christina, if you want to speak a little bit more about that, the sort of further process that that um, LASA engages in directly with subrecipients. Yeah, so as a part of um, the monitoring process, um, which happens on an annual basis, um, we also have moved to a more um, 
concurrent monitoring where we do a check in with agencies to make sure that they're allocating costs and spending the resources down in alignment with the funder requirements. Um, that happens quarterly. So cost allocation plans are required and agencies submit them um, as a part of that monitoring review. I think one of the things that we're looking to do with this, these recommendations is to streamline and ensure that we're not placing additional administrative burdens on agencies by having LH LHD go out and monitor separately than the monitoring that LASA is doing, but we're coordinating efforts. And so if there's information that LHD would like to see as, as it relates to how LASA is monitoring the fund, that that would be coordinated through LASA versus creating an additional burden on the agencies. We've heard them say that um, having multiple agencies monitor them on the same things is, is very um, challenging for them. Um, one agency in particular reached out to me recently and said, they've got 14 audits going on at one time. So what they're looking for is streamlining. They want to make sure that, you know, if LASA is the agency of choice for um, the administration of the fund, that, you know, we're making it less burdensome for them, not more burdensome with the streamlining and recommendations that are coming forward. Right. We just, we all share that, that goal. Um, next question, I, the council, uh, Chairwoman, I think was getting at this, but I don't know that I got the answer or heard the answer. I, you know, I support recommendation C. It initiates uh, LAHD and LASA contracting to be concurrent. Um, but what I don't understand, and I think she was asking, is why doesn't LAHD and LASA do this now? What, why does this require council action? So maybe I could address that. Um, having had some chats with staff back and forth while this um, conversation was going on. Uh, this recommendation perhaps would have been more impactful if we had left the recommendation that we removed in place about multi-year contracts. Um, right now, there's nothing in our agreement with LASA that prohibits them from getting started on a contract, um, although they couldn't go so far that it would be considered a supplantation issue at some point, but nothing that says they can't work, you know, on the, on the um, getting the subcontracts ready and and the terms with the providers, but it's not unknown that the city sometimes changes, you know, our requirements in the process that we're talking about. So it's a matter of kind of partnership and trust to make sure that we're moving down the path together. I think what we were looking for is an expression of intention by the city that we wanted to up that level of partnership and trust so that we could do this understanding that at some point loss is going to wait to make sure that that contract's coming along before they get you know, too far coming along with the terms and the scope of work that we've all discussed before they get too far down the path. So this is really not removing a legal barrier. It's really just removing a recommending that we urge us to come together and, and stop that as a practice as much as we can. Okay, so, so great. I'm happy to support that and, and it, it makes sense. Hey, uh, right now, it seems that both LAHD and CAO uh, are doing homeless contract work. And when it comes to reporting and monitoring of data collected, the CAO probably should be the one taking the lead, which seems to be the recommendation for D. And I just wanted to confirm that the CAO agrees with this recommendation. Good afternoon, um, uh, council members. Uh, yes, the CAO helped uh, actually uh, the housing department in preparing the, the report back when it was initially drafted and agrees with the recommendations. Great. Um, now, when it comes to raising the administrative cap, uh, recommendation F, is the housing department rec recommending raising the administrative cap for the city or for LASA? And if it's for LASA, um, how does this interact with the, with the million dollars that we just gave to LASA for additional administrative staff? And if it's for LAHD or the CAO to utilize grant funding to assist the city to cover our admin costs, I get that too. But I guess I, I want to get a report about the administrative caps for each source of funds and where we are on the limits, because um, that's not exactly clear to me. Right. Yes. So, um, so recommendation I would essentially instruct LHD to work um, with CAO um, to essentially assess the feasibility of raising the cap. So it's a report back that provides. Um, and, and obviously, it would be uh, it would be updated with the, the recent actions of, of the council. 
this um, the assessment that's provided currently is, is from the original report. And so that would have to be reassessed with some of the more recent council actions. Yeah, I guess I'd be, I'd be more comfortable if we amended it to instruct CAO in partnership with LAHD to review the administrative cap rate for all general funded loss of contracts and report back with recommendations as to what's in the best interest of the LA city taxpayers. Um, because I do worry about sort of double, triple dipping here. Um, rather than instructing them to do it, we instruct them, CAO, to review the administrative cap. Okay. So, I think uh, this, this, was a, this was a recommendation to review as far as I read it. It was not a... It, it was unclear to me, so I, I, and I'll go through. I have a couple of, of, of suggestions to well, slightly reword that to to see if it, to make it to make it crystal clear if that's okay and I'll, I can go through those uh, in a moment. Um, so other just questions I want to get a couple questions out and then and then put forward some ideas if, if it suits the chair. Um, Sorry, Councilmember Bloomfield, if we could, um, I just want to say that the line in the in the report says LHG recommends that the council instruct LHG in partnership with the CEO to look into the financial implications and benefits of adopting an increased administrative cap rate. So it's not asking them to do it, but if you wanted to, yeah, well, the, the not sure how has, that would be has, significantly different from what you're suggesting. Well, the report has LHG as the lead to report on the administrative cap, and I'm asking for CAO uh, to take the lead on that. So that's that's the main difference there. The CAO in partnership with LAHD to review the cap and to do it for all general funded contracts and report back the recommendations that are in the best interest of our taxpayer, which is, I think we're saying the same thing. I'm just trying to make it crystal clear. Um, so the, the factors, I mean, LASA historically has underspent our general fund contracts and then there's a, a savings. What, what typically happens with the savings? Um, we, so, so for example, for this last year, um, which is our most recent, um, our most recent example, um, the, the underspent was approximately $5.8 million, which was rolled over into the next general fund contract. So that was about a 10% underspent. Okay. So we generally have to go through um, a rollover process when when a contract comes to its conclusion and move it into a different contract. Okay. All right. I'm going I'm to go through a couple of the the specific recommendations and with some ideas. Which is um, on on A. I think we changed that already. Streamlining the categories. Uh, I was just worried. I, I want to make sure that whatever we do on A that we're you know, I worry about getting rid of all the line item specific things by reducing the categories. Just want to make sure we still have the transparency. And uh, I'm not sure we got, I think, did we get rid of a, we just got rid of the multi-year part, but we still have the streamline part. Is that right? Of a, so um, or did so we get rid of the entirety of a? So the streamlining of program categories um, was previously recommendation B and in the most recent uh, transmittal, it reads as item A or recommendation A. So how do, how do we avoid losing the transparency, which has been an issue in, I mean, I, I'm all for streamlining, uh, but I mean, what sometimes happens, you put these general categories and then we don't really know what was spent. So that so, just concerns me a little bit in terms of the transparency. Sorry, go ahead. Um, so council member, we, we generally um, within our process also collect an itemized budget, which provides uh, where spending is gonna, where um, expenditures are gonna be incurred. And, and that's a fairly detailed itemized budget that's supplemental to this. Um, the recommendation here is really to ensure that we are in alignment with the process that, that was initiated by the CAO in, in last year's budget and, and that we're ensuring that we're aligning there. And so the information could be provided at various levels, both at these broader um, four categories, but also um, in additional categories if needed. And where, if we wanted to review those itemized budgets, is that something we have access to? Where, where would we do that? So I've never seen that. We could work with, with your team to provide that if, 
but that that would be something that would be available uh, to council offices or would be available publicly? Um, it would be on request to council offices. Okay, and I imagine it's public record if somebody actually requested it, right? Um, and, and CAO supports these consolidations, I assume, because you said you worked on this? If not, speak up. I guess. No, that, that's correct, we do, we concur. Okay, and then um, on B, my, I had a concern about, is this creating more work for our subrecipients who are complaining about it? Because I'm okay with this as long as it doesn't create more work for the subrecipients. Is there any concern about that? Will the housing department be able to review the subrecipient plan without adding a lot of burden to them? Yes, yeah, so, um, as, as Christina mentioned earlier, I think we would work together collectively to ensure that this wouldn't add um, any additional burden to subrecipients. Okay. And then on um, F, it says council analyze the existing contract to increase the administrative cap to provide greater flexibility. I guess, you know, I'm a little concerned about increase, I'm concerned about increasing the cap. I'm happy to do it, especially if it's helping the city. Uh, I'm worried about the, the sort of blanket doing that with LASA. So I, again, I'd like to amend that to instruct the CAO to analyze existing ordinance to provide greater flexibility within the contract process to enable grantees to receive payments more rapidly and report on and report on the administrative cap status for each funding source related to homelessness which is just making that a little bit more clear so i'd like to recommend that as a as a tweet i didn't follow can you repeat okay. that so to on, on f to amend it so that we instruct the cao to analyze the existing ordinance to provide greater flexibility within the contracts process to enable grantees to receive payment more rapidly and report on the administrative cap status for each funding source related to homelessness. So you want to change the department that's reporting on this from CAO to LHD? I want to instruct CAO to analyze That's the right. existing orders. Sorry, LHG to CAO. Yes. And 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 the slight wording as I, as I mentioned. Okay. I mean, I don't think it changes the. That's fine. Okay. And then, um, Mr. Blumenfield, I just want to. Um, I want to just make. Is do you have significant changes on, on other? I'm, I'm almost done with this. I mean, yeah. uh, just looking again, because some of these were confusing to me. That's why we went through this. But I already talked about I. Uh, we went through that one already, um, and that's fine. I'll, I'll stop right there. How about that? So. Okay. I mean, I'm I'm fine with the CAO being the primary lead on this since it seems like both of the departments were working together on this anyway. So I don't know that it's going to substantively change the process, but uh, I want to throw it to the departments to concur with that. Um, we, we concur. Okay. Okay, great. Okay, um, great. So uh, provided there are no other questions, I think we can move forward to take a vote on this. Yes, Madam Chair, can we vote just- on the, Vote on the this item uh, with the amendments that Mr. Blumenfield mentioned. As well as LHD's amendment um, before public comment, is that correct, Madam Chair? Yes, thank you for that. Council Member Rahman. Yes. Council Member Blumenfield. Aye. Council Member Harris Dawson. Yes. Council Member Rodriguez. Aye. Council Member Lee. Aye. Five ayes and this item is approved as amended. Okay, great. Well, let's move on to, um, if we can f finish item seven uh, quickly, I think there's probably just a question from Councilmember Lee on this. Um, Mr. Brano, could you read this item into the record? Item number seven is a motion, Raman Blumenfield et al, relative to the establishment of a right to council ordinance and program and related matters. 
Okay, great. Um, and Mr. Lee, if you had any, oh, I wanted to just say uh, on this item, you know, just thank so many people called in today and I'm sure there were more people waiting in the queue uh, to talk about this item. So thank you all. Um, and I'm excited to see this move forward. I think this really comes out of, uh, you know, the advocacy work of the people behind the ULA ballot measure. Um, the, the ballot measure has recommended that a certain percentage of those funds are set aside to create a right to counsel here in the city. Um, and to me, this, this motion is really just um, giving a shape to what the ballot measure has asked that we do. And I wanna just thank um, the incredible leadership of those organizations, SAGE, ACE, dozens of housing justice organizations in moving this forward, and, and also to thank Councilmember Blumenfield uh, for his support in this motion. So Councilmember Lee, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I just wanted to ask, and I don't know who I'm directing this at, but um, the, uh, there was supposed to be a, a citizen oversight committee that was established with the passage of Measure ULA. You know, that oversight committee was supposed to sort of direct about how we're supposed to use these funds and prepare program guidelines. Is that happening? You want to go ahead, Ms. Sewell? I could address that, I think. Um, Ann Sewell, General Manager of the Los Angeles Housing Department. My understanding is that um, the deadline was yesterday to for the mayor to um, announce those appointments and send them to the council. My understanding is that was done. Um, it may be in your inbox somewhere, but yes, all 15 of those um, positions have been named. Okay. And, and yes, council member, the the measure is a little bit like peeling an onion. Um, there's the oversight committee has a very strong role in um, you know reviewing and approving program guidelines. There's a lot of program guidelines baked into the measure, and the department also has a very strong role in kind of translating from the measure to what goes to the um, the oversight committee for approval and then on through to the council and the mayor. Um, so we will all be working on that together hopefully fruitfully as soon as the lawsuit is um, resolved. Okay, just wanna make sure that that's happening. Obviously we wanna help as many people as possible with this program. I, I just hope that uh, as this moves forward that we come back with some sort of review, like to explanation about what the review process is so that we don't have people um, tying up these funds. We wanna make sure that we're really protecting against bad evictions and that this program isn't being abused uh, in order to you know, bring settlement. So I'm, I'm hoping that there's a review process that happens ahead of time that says that it's not just a blanket, sort of everyone gets, if they want you know, representation, that there's some sort of formal review process to make sure that we are making sure that we are helping as many people as possible. Um, does anyone know, but the, but I know that we modeled this after the San Francisco's program, and I'm just trying to get a kind of idea of how many people we're gonna be able to service. Do we have any idea of what the average cost per case is? I could find that for you by the end of the meeting. Um, I knew that and have now forgotten it. Anna, no do problem. you know that? No problem. I mean, if you can get, if you can just give me that information, Anne. I appreciate that. And then I want to throw out an amount, but I that I'd rather check it. Okay. It's something okay. under five thousand. Okay. And has there been any consideration in um, creating a new division within the city attorney's office uh, to provide this council so that we don't, you know, anytime I'm always worried about uh, a lot of lawsuits against the city, they get dragged out because we're the deep pocket city of Los Angeles. Um, and I don't want that abuse to happen because we're obviously trying to help people and we don't want this money to be just, you know, where we're, we're basing it on some, uh, you know, bad actor type, you know, attorneys out there. Have, has there been any consideration in possibly housing this 
within using that funding to house us within the city attorney's office so that we would have our own branch to help people, you know, fight bad evictions? Uh, so we will be returning to the council with a um, response to a motion uh, that Councilman Rahman and others put forward uh, about ULA implementation. And as we've been working on that, some of, some of that is an analysis of somebody needs to do this work. It is not always clear whether that somebody is within City Hall or an external partner like Stay Housed. It's not always clear which department it is. Um, and I think those are questions to be considered further down. I don't know that that's come up around eviction because there's such a robust in the stay housed um, community, there's such a robust uh, program already started up to build on, but we've definitely had conversations like that around the tenant anti-harassment um, work with the city attorney's office. Okay. And I just want to make sure that there's, you know, safeguards put in place, you know, again, I hate to keep saying this, we want to make sure that this program is truly helping the people who need it and help the, you know, as many people as possible um, so that, you know, that there is an abuse of this program. But also, if we can, uh, I'd like to, you know, direct the, the housing department to make sure that we, that you engage all the sort of stakeholders feedbacks, and that includes housing providers as part of this uh, to conversation to make sure that they, you know, I feel that they feel that they've been sort of left out sometimes. And if we can make sure that we engage them as part of the conversation of this moving forward, I think it's going to be helpful for everyone. If that's an instruction, I'll second it. Thank you. That is it, uh, Madam Chair. Okay. That sounds good. And I did want to flag for you, Mr. Lee, that um, there is an implementation kind of a, a, a rollout that is planned for this that's included as part of the instructions, I believe in ULA itself, um, which is based on starting with certain zip codes and then expanding. So I think there's opportunities to see a phased implementation with some kind of uh, understanding of how it's being implemented in the first area before we move on expanding it in other places. So I think some of the questions that you're asking could be both asked and, um, answered and potentially uh, lead to amendments to how the program is designed going forward. So I appreciate your question. So let, are we ready to move on voting on the item as amended? Question. Oh, okay, sure. Sorry. Um, and and I'm, I'm happy I said to, to second Mr. Lee's instruction about just making sure that it's inclusive of housing providers and the instruction. Um, and I'm very excited about it. Ms. Raman, you've been doing great work on this and, and ULA is a game changer. And this is really great that we're moving forward on this. I had one question just based on uh, one of the callers uh, said something that, that I surprised me, I don't think is accurate. I just wanted to clear it up, which is they were claiming that our lawyers are getting, in addition to getting paid, are getting some sort of a contingency. Uh, and that's not my understanding, but I just want to clarify that since they they stated that that somehow there's in addition to the the money that we're providing that there is this percentage of settlement i've never heard that but i wanted to to throw that out there so that people who were listening and heard that caller would also have the answer um anna ortega Housing. Um, no, I not not uh, not our attorneys in, through our state um, eviction defense program. I think that might be a practice with private attorneys um, that defend tenants sometimes, but it's it's not part of our process. But if we're if we're paying the eviction defense, they're not also getting a contingency. We're paying no. the service and whatever. If they win and if there is money, it goes directly to the tenant. Correct. Correct. Okay. Wanted to clear that up. That's always been my understanding, but someone called in saying something different. Glad that was put out there and, and that record is clear and, and I'm, I'd love to move forward on the item. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, sounds like I think that question was answered. I don't believe that lawyers are gonna be double dipping here. And so I, I think we're good. So let's move on, uh, vote, sorry, let's vote on the item as amended. Mr. Rano, can you call the roll? Council Member Rahman. Yes. Council Member Blumenfield. Aye. Council Member Harris Dawson. Yes. 
Councilmember Rodriguez. Aye. Councilmember Lee. Aye. Five ayes and this item is approved as amended. Okay, great. So um, in the interest of time, I wanna move on to items nine and 10, um, which are both related to RVs. Uh, I think since there's some overlap in the recommendations, uh, we can, I don't think we'll be able to separate them out in the discussion. So let's read both of these items into the record. We'll have to take separate votes on them and we'll start by discussing item 10, but Mr. Rano, could you please read these items into the record? Yes, Madam Chair. Item number nine is a city administrative officer report relative to a citywide rehousing strategy for people experiencing recreational vehicle homelessness and related matters. Item number 10 is a city administrative officer report relative to the implementation and analysis of the pilot recreational vehicle RV to home program in council district seven and related matters. Great, so I'm excited to discuss both of the, uh, the citywide homelessness strategy again and excited to hear the new report from the CAO related to Council District 7's pilot. Um, and I think it's really exciting that we're gonna be talking about a citywide strategy. So I wanted to invite Councilmember Rodriguez to say a few words about your pilot program before we throw it over to the CAO. Perfect, thank you so much, Madam Chair. And colleagues, uh, the item before us today, and I wanna thank you, Ms. Rahman, for uh, providing us the opportunity to have this conversation together uh, with respect to item nine and item 10, uh, because the item that we have before you with respect to item 10 is addressing and presenting the strategy that we've deployed in my district. As uh, many of you are familiar, between from 2019 to 2022, we saw an increase of 41% of uh, RV dwellings uh, across the city. And uh, I know Mr. Lee, Mr. Blumenfield, you are uh, very well aware of some of the challenges uh, that we face specifically in parts of the San Fernando Valley where we've seen uh, substantial growth of, uh, of these, uh, of the RV uh, encampments, uh, particularly in the San Fernando Valley. <clears throat> As a result, working with West Valley, yes, uh, LA Family Housing and LASA, we deployed a pilot program in my district where we led with outreach uh, in identifying key corridors where we had large populations of uh, RV dwelling in my district. As a result of the processes and protocols that we've established through this pilot, uh, with really minimizing uh, any LAPD involvement, we have created a system and an approach that, uh, that helps uh, facilitate acceptance of housing for the individuals that we have approached. In fact, uh, to date with our efforts uh, as since, since the deployment uh, in uh, February 22 to February 2023 of this year, we've had success in removing and disposing of 34 RVs, uh, 44 individuals having been housed, um, and 70 individuals that are enrolled in our programs with 26 individuals awaiting more permanent placement into housing. So we are in the process of getting all of these pieces in alignment, but most importantly, the part uh, that many of you are familiar with is what has been a very lengthy disposition process because of, uh, in many cases, the uh, lack of value for scrap metaling and everything, uh, for the, to manage the disposition. Uh, also, more importantly, even the placement of uh, interim storage of these items to ensure that they are removed from our streets, because oftentimes they present very serious public safety hazards, uh, both from uh, sewage leakage to obstruction of, of view and right of way uh, on our city streets. And so for that, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm happy uh, and thankful to uh, my team and the CAO's office uh, who has done the diligence of getting kind of all of the pieces in alignment. Um, you know, we had a very lengthy conversation, for example, just in uh, streamlining uh, the contracting process and getting people paid and doing, you know, for the same reason we had this conversation with respect to how we accelerate the pace with which we uh, get people into housing, um, get the uh, disposition of the RVs uh, accelerated because as we know what we currently have in place 
requires a very lengthy process that is oftentimes unsuccessful because we don't have the interim facilities to manage the disposition of the RVs. And so this kind of memorializes, this memorializes all the different facets that enable us to be compliant, to do it quickly, to do it right, and ultimately get people housed. And so I'm really proud of this work. And again, I thank my team, Christian Tafoya, Paula Basignana, and of course our partners with LASA, LA Family Housing, and West Valley Yes, to help develop a strategy that I think is going to be a successful approach to how we do this work citywide. And so with that, Mr. Buckner, I will turn it over to you before asking my colleagues to join me in an I vote. Great. Thank you, Ms. Rodriguez. Yeah, it's a really exciting program. Mr. Buckner, do you want to present your report? Uh, sure, I don't know that I have much left to uh, present uh, after it was uh, expertly framed by the uh, councilwoman. So, uh, good afternoon. Um, Buckner, where, are you in a parking lot? I'm in my office. That's just a parking sign from, uh, from El Pueblo, from the El Puente Bridge home. Oh, okay. Uh, so, good afternoon. Um, I'm Brian Buckner, City Homelessness Coordinator in the Office of the CAO. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss actually our two complementary reports, um, one that laid out the uh, proposed citywide strategy, and then this report, which talks about the pilot that was implemented in Council District 7. Uh, with me today uh, is Sophia Peralta, who's our Director of Homeless Outreach for the CAO's office, who co-authored the, both reports with me, along with two of our regional outreach coordinators, Rachel Fox and China Gerstner, who also helped to prepare the reports. Um, I know that they're, they're also present, uh, mostly probably listening, maybe hoping they don't get called on, but we have our partners from LASA, LAPD, the Department of Transportation, uh, City Attorney's Office, and Sanitation uh, here today. And I really want to especially thank our colleagues at uh, Council District 7 and Councilwoman uh, named her staff who helped to answer all of our questions and get us all of the information about the great work happening with the pilot. also want to thank Kim Olson and the, the staff and partners at West Valley Homes, yes. LASA and, and LA Family Housing for their work on the pilot. So the purpose of this report was to detail the innovative RT Arita Home uh, Rehousing Program operated by West Valley Homes, yes, in partnership with LASA, LA Family Housing, and with support from Councilmember Rodriguez and her staff in Council District 7. And while this report is focused on the pilot that was implemented in the Council District, this report and our findings and recommendations are actually complementary to and are really meant to be considered along with the CEO's report on the proposed citywide rehousing strategy for people experiencing RV, RV homelessness that was discussed last week and continued to, to this week. Um, and in fact, I want to point out that we actually designed the citywide strategy based on the pilot, as well as the ongoing RV operations being managed across the city by my staff and the important lessons learned from all of these experiences. And it was the pilot program success that was a larger reason why this office embedded its lessons and elements into the proposed citywide strategy, along with its alignment with best practices and the city's street engagement strategy. But as to why the RV issues are so pressing, the councilwoman already laid them out, but over the last three years, there's been a significant increase in the number of individuals who are homeless and residing in their vehicles. According to the most recently available point in time count data from LASA, nearly 6,500 people experiencing homelessness in the city were living in approximately 4,000 RVs, and that number has increased by 40% since 2018, and it represents nearly a quarter of the city's total unsheltered homes population, which is incredibly significant. And so to begin addressing the issue in their council district, uh, Council District 7 collaborated with West Valley Homes, yes, LASA and LA Family Housing, pilot this program that was designed to address the unique needs of the individuals by providing appropriate housing, vehicle storage, and incentives for relinquishing their vehicles. Uh, just a brief overview of the program. Uh, the RV to Home program used the trauma-informed services first approach to directly engage people living in their RVs and vehicles and to provide them with interim and permanent housing solutions as well as connecting them to supportive services. The program emphasized individual choice and avoided coercion by allowing individuals to return to their vehicles if they chose to exit the program. In order to engage and have individuals accept housing, West Valley Homes Yes provided temporary storage for their vehicle, which was a critical element of the program. The option of storage slots for RVs provided these individuals with a way to ensure that they were comfortable with their housing placement 
before taking the necessary steps to secure permanent housing. Uh, West Valley Homes Yes faced many barriers when working with individuals and their vehicles, uh, particularly in regards to demonstrating vehicle ownership, and it's why the disposition process that the Councilwoman talked about was such a critical element of this program. Um, they, and, and I know the council staff work closely with LAPD and the Department of Transportation on that process. Uh, West Valley Homes Yes also provided support with obtaining proper documentation, uh, including vehicle registration, uh, licenses, and helping to uh, facilitate vehicle service repairs and bringing the RVs into a sellable condition. Additionally, they provided food outreach and other supportive services uh, to help build trust and rapport with the people who are living in their vehicles and help connect them to critical resources. The program offered ongoing engagement and advocacy for participants when possible, uh, all with a focus on keeping them from going back to the streets. Uh, as noted by the Councilwoman, uh, by February of this year, a total of 70 individuals had been served by the program. Of these, 39 were placed in interim housing, five were moved into permanent housing, and only two returned to homelessness, resulting in a 95% success rate, which is, uh, which is pretty incredible. West Valley Homes is still engaging in supporting the remaining 26 individuals enrolled in the program until they secure housing. Uh, and again, as noted by the Councilwoman, a total of 34 RVs have been removed from the streets, with 24 of them having been disposed of, seven awaiting disposal, and three pending sale. Um, as this was a pilot program, there were some important lessons learned. One of the challenges encountered by the outreach was the need for thorough data collection. That's one of the reasons why the staff there actually recommended, uh, it's, as this is implemented as a part of the citywide strategy, that there really be a prioritization and funding to support robust data collection and reporting. Apologies on the sensitivity of the light here. Um, there were several challenges that were encountered in the, uh, in the pilot year. And one of them, again, was, was staffing. West Valley uh, Homes Yes had, I think, two dedicated full-time staff to the program, um, and additional staff and support for housing navigation. And so there's a need for a more, more robust staffing model uh, as the program is rolled out and expanded to additional locations. Uh, participants who were placed in interim housing required additional support to attend scheduled appointments, medical and DMV appointments, um, and continuing, again, to advocate for obtaining necessary documentation and appointment needs. So there's ongoing support that clients need, uh, which is also, uh, you know, we know critical to helping them along their pathway into permanent housing. And then, as I said earlier, securing parking lots uh, to increase storage uh, was, was a critical, uh, both an in, innovative uh, and important element of the program, but also uh, just a, a challenge given the, the limited capacity that the city has across uh, across the, the, the entire city. Although I know that there are there's at least one report back from the police commission and several motions that are looking at continuing to examine um, existing public resources or even private resources to use for this purpose. Uh, and then uh, again, just one caveat I know that we added, um, but that the uh, if council does uh, adopt the citywide strategy. Um, that we just recommend continuing to engage with the city attorney's office uh, just to make sure that the elements of the citywide strategy and, and some of the components of the, the pilot that were um, embedded into that strategy are, are just continue to engage with the city attorney's office to make sure that the city is reducing uh, any liability or exposure to liability. Um, and then uh, happy to answer any questions that the council has about this, uh, this report or the prior report on the proposed citywide uh, strategy. Okay, um, thank you, um, Mr. Buckner. I wanted to ask. Um, there were some, some of there was some overlap in the recommendations from the two reports. I think because the pilot was included in your analysis for the citywide strategy, um, but there were some differences as well. So I wanted to ask about a couple of those differences. Um, you talked about zoning considerations and asked planning to come back to you with recommendations on zoning considerations in terms of RV disposal. Uh, would you say that's a lesson that's limited to expanding this pilot or is that something that should be incorporated as part of a citywide strategy as well? Uh, so we, we think that that should be a part of the citywide strategy. Um, that was based on a number of conversations that we had had and we just weren't prepared to include that recommendation in the prior report yet without some additional conversations. And so that's why we included it. In, in this report um, as opposed to the citywide strategy, but, but we do think that that's an important part of uh, a closer examination of what the implications of the citywide strategy would be. Okay, um, 
Okay, great. Um, Councilmember Blumenfield. Great, um, thank you, and and thank you, Ms. Rodriguez, uh, for piloting this this program. It's it, uh, it's uh, great, and I, I love that it's being folded into this report. And the West Valley Homes, yes, folks, I've had the privilege of working with Kim and and the folks over there, and and really appreciate uh, the great work that they have done, and that they're helping push the city in a positive direction. Uh, I had uh, to be brief. I had a little tweak uh, and additional on the. Um, instructions on instruction nine i just wanted to add it says instruct the cao i wanted to add the words with the assistance of the cla to work with the mayor's office and council offices lasa etc uh just to make that clear that helps and then i wanted to add two instructions one uh, number 10 would be instruct the cao with the assistance of the cla to prioritize programs within the citywide rehousing strategy for people experiencing RV homelessness to correspond with available funding. Just to make sure that we, um, that we're not looking at this in a vacuum, we're looking at it with regard to our resources. And then uh, number 11, instruct the CAO with the assistance of the CLA to report back on the city's encampment resolution fund application prior to the submission and, and to solicit input from council offices on locations to include which may they may do that anyway but i just wanted to make that explicit because i think it's important that our council offices be uh, included in that process councilman bloomfield it sounds like these are recommendations that are for item for nine for nine you said take nine and ten together that's why yes that's right no sorry i just wanted to clarify and uh, yeah that's fine all of those are fine with me we had discussed those briefly last time um, and I would just uh, add an additional recommendation, which we also discussed last time to nine, which was instruct the CAO to include in its prioritization of RVs to be served through the citywide strategies, um, uh, factors including RVs with larger numbers of people in them, families with minor children, the condition of the RVs, and the condition and characteristics of the surrounding area, such as fire sensitivity. Great. Yep, okay. So I'm comfortable with all those uh, additional recommendations. Is there any other comments or um, questions that people have on either of these items? Wow, wonderful, very positive. Uh, let's take a vote on each of those items. Do we have to vote on them separately or can we take them? Uh, separately, Madam Chair. We're, we're amending okay. item number nine, correct? Yes, let's start with item nine as amended with the recommendations that uh, both Councilmember Blumenfield and I added. Councilmember Rahman. Yes. Councilmember Blumenfield. Blumenfield, aye. Councilmember Harris Dawson. Yes. Councilmember Rodriguez. Aye. Councilmember Lee. Councilmember Lee is absent. Four ayes, and this item is approved as amended. Great. Thank you all, and congratulations, Councilmember Rodriguez, on bringing this pilot uh, hopefully to more parts of the city. Um, let's move on to item. Oh, do we just need to take the Wait, vote oh, for sorry, item number 10? Okay. Item, oh, item 10, sorry. Go. sorry. <laughs> go ahead, I, let's move, uh, vote on item 10. Council I spoke too soon. Council Member Rahman. Yes. Council Member Blumenfield. Aye. Council Member Harris Dawson. Yes. Council Member Rodriguez. Aye. Council Member Lee. Council Member Lee is absent. Four, four ayes and this item is approved. Okay. Well, now, congratulations. <laughs> okay, let's move on to item eight. Thank you, Mr. Buckner, for your reporting um, and for your hard work on this. Uh, let's go to item eight, which is the Fast Track Solutions Loan Program. And uh, this was an item brought to us by LAHD. Mr. Grano, can you please read this item into the record? Item number eight is a Los Angeles Housing Department report relative to implementing a Fast Track Solutions Loan Program for approved affordable housing projects. Okay, so the item that is before us, um, it didn't, so I just want to provide a little bit of context here. It didn't come out of a motion. This is a, um, a, something that came to us directly from the department. And the reason why the department is bringing it forward is because of a fairly concerning situation that some of the housing projects that the city has already approved have suddenly found themselves in. A large number of the projects that are in the pipeline that we've already provided funding to, so we've given some amount of city commitment already, um, and it's about a thousand total housing units that would be impacted, including many supportive housing units, 
These are units that are now experiencing some serious financial challenges because of changes in market conditions that have happened since we approved them. Um, and maybe these were approved long before I was here. <laughs> Um, and the market conditions that have changed include changes in interest rates, increases in interest rates specifically, increases in insurance premiums, and subsequent increases in contingency and reserve requirements that have been imposed by lenders and investors. And I know that there's been some issues also in dealing with DWP, that DWP costs have been higher than what projects originally estimated for, um, uh, uh, for new power lines and things like that. So we understand that LAHD has put together this report to respond to this need and protect the long-term viability of these projects. And I wanted to just invite the department to speak to their proposal. Um, and I think I really wanna just make sure that, you know, as you're speaking to it, I think Ms. Sewell, you're gonna be presenting on this, right? Um, as you speak to it, I think one thing that would be useful for this committee to understand is um, this is a new, um, you know, devolution of our authority to, to oversee funds that, that you're asking for from us as a council. Um, and I think it would be really useful to understand why you're asking for it at this time and what kind of oversight mechanisms we may have, even as you're designing uh, this particular intervention in a particular way, um, and uh, what the time pressures that you're facing are. If we don't, you know, if we don't do it in the structure that you're suggesting, what, what are the risks that we're facing? So I think if you could lay that out in your presentation, that would be very helpful for us. So Ms. Sewell, I turn it to you. Thank you, um, Madam Chair and, and Council Members. So um, Ann Sewell, General Manager of the Los Angeles Housing Department, and I would just um, say that this is uh, the department, but also in partnership with the, um, the Deputy Mayor and the Mayor's team related to ED1 and streamlining of you know, all these projects. Um, so you know, the proposal before you is to authorize a Fast Track Solutions loan program um, that, as the councilwoman said, would help projects that have already been approved by the council and mayor. In some cases, they've had multiple approvals because they are both HHH projects and tax exempt bond projects um, and help them because they are stuck right now, either in the almost to start construction or construction stages because of all these um, unforeseen increases. So it's not the first time that the mayor and the council have directed the department to do something when major market disruptions have impacted our affordable housing programs. We did something like this in the Great Recession, in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, early changes in the, in the pandemic. But typically what we've done is we've been authorized to issue a notice of funding availability, take in proposals, review them, rank them, and bring them as recommendations to the committees and the council, which takes about four months altogether. The attachment that came in the supplemental report shows 169 projects that are in the pipeline currently that are either in the pre-construction stage, in construction, or have just finished construction and are still truing up their construction loans. Although not all of these projects experienced significant cost increases that exceeded contingencies, many of them did. Many of them have been able to secure additional funds from the county or the state. About 20 of them you've seen coming through this committee and onto council one by one as supplemental allocations of tax exempt bonds. But there are at least 10 to 20 that are stuck. They've done all they can to close gaps and they, in our estimation, need additional city subsidy in order to protect our current investment. As the councilwoman said, there's at least a thousand units, probably more in that situation so that they can go forward and you know, be housing for people sooner than something that we would approve today and, and go through the whole entitlement process. Um, so it, this is a different devolution of authority that we are asking for. In all of our other programs, the council approves guidelines, funding amounts, and we go out and we do NOFAs and we bring you the projects piece by piece. Actually, there's one program that that's not true in our home ownership programs. You approve, approve the guidelines and we just do the loans without bringing you each, each home ownership project piece by piece. But in everything else, we usually bring it to you one by one. In this case, we, because we need to move so quickly, we think this is a six week to eight week timeline for most of these projects. Some of them are literally in construction being held by their lenders from moving forward because their loans are out of balance. The lender doesn't see how they're going to, you know, be able to complete. Um, others are 
at risk of losing tax credits if they don't move forward in the next month and a half. So um, because of that, we've tried to create a very prescribed set of requirements and um, to ask you to give us the authority. One of the amendments that was um, proposed um, through the CAO and through some of the council members is that in addition to the department reviewing this and the city attorney reviewing it, we would create an administrative oversight committee comprised of the CLA, the CAO, and the deputy mayor who would review it after the department had reviewed it to make sure that we had stayed within the prescribed um, requirements that we've laid out. Um, and we, we support that as, you know, and we would envision that meeting almost weekly until we get all this money out the door because we think it'll happen that quickly. Um, and, and then of course there is the additional um, recommendation about um, reports. We would propose to do those monthly. Again, we don't think this is gonna be an ongoing forever program. We think that we are gonna move quickly on this. So I'm happy to answer any questions. I know you've probably all seen the requirements um, that are recommended for approval in the report. Okay, thank you so much, Ms. Sewell. So I wanted to start by asking, um, I think part, your presentation in part was able to um, answer one of the questions, but so the number of projects that you're hoping to impact with this fund is somewhere between 10 to 20? Yes, you know, the, the requirements, uh, developers have to basically show us that they've done all that they can. And there's also a deferral of developer fee requirement. So we think this isn't going to be something people do lightly. They will come in because they truly are stuck. And by and we're, we keep in touch with all of these as they go through. So I think that we will have more than 10 and fewer than 20 that come to us. Okay. And do you believe that the amount of money that is here will be enough to address the needs of those 10 to 20 that you think need this in order to stay viable? We hope so. And if it isn't, we probably would bring the ones at the tail end to you case by case, depending on what that looked like, as we would have, you know, as I said, you've seen a number of them go through already case by case for supplemental bond um, increases, but we're trying to do this more quickly. Okay, um, great. Councilmember Blumenfield. Great, thank you. And, and uh, I think like you, Madam Chair, I'm, 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 I'm wary and, and worried about oversight loss, but I also recognize the crisis that we're in and, you know, we have to get these, these built. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm prepared to move forward on this, uh, but concerned about the oversight. The parameters, do they include like a, a dollar figure in terms of like how high we'll go per unit? They do. So depending on the original program that these projects were approved under, HHH or the managed pipeline, there's a couple of them that are um, affordable housing, sustainable communities projects. There was a maximum loan limit. For most of the HHH projects, for instance, it's 140,000 per unit. In order to be eligible, the project would have to be under that loan limit. And so we could lend them the difference between what their original per unit amount was and the 140, but in no case more than $7 million per project. Got it. So it's not a per unit, but it's per project and it's it's up to the $140,000 loan unit. I got it. Okay, uh, makes sense to me. The one thing I, I might add is, you know, you're saying that it's, it's a one-time pot of money uh, it's not going to be moving into next year, but just maybe um, have LAHD report back to council on funding sources if the fast track solution loan program continues beyond this fiscal year, uh, because it could. And uh, so I'd like to add that in as a as a report back, um, just to to keep that that concept going. Although hopefully it's not needed because it's not going to go beyond the year. That sounds fine. So I'd, I'd do that as a, as a formal amendment. Okay, so that's, uh, that's I'm comfortable with that um, amendment. So if people are okay with this program, you know, I, I, um, I actually think in some ways, seeing all of these amendments together, I know we've been seeing some of these come in, the changes come in. Um, I think Mr. Harris Doss and I signed something for you um, last week related to addressing exactly this situation. I actually think seeing it all together in this way will 
give us more oversight and more understanding over what's happening, you know, then if you see it one by one coming through the committee, I think you actually tend to see it less. So um, with that, I want to move to take a vote on this item. Uh, Mr. Verano, can you call the roll? Council Member Rahman. Yes. Council Member Blumenfield. Blumenfield, aye. Council Member Harris Dawson. Yes. Council Member Rodriguez. Aye. Council Member Lee. Council Member Lee is absent. Four ayes, and this item is approved as amended. Okay, great. Um, and I want to make sure that we are not going to lose quorum. Um, we have one more item, I believe, on the agenda. It's just item 12, which is a CES presentation. And I think what we could do is um, to have the presentation and potentially move discussion to the next week. But I do think it's important, since it's been in the news recently, for us to at least hear the presentation from LASA. If, if people are able to stay, I believe the presentation will take about 10 minutes. Maybe 20 minutes. We'll try and be as fast as we can. Uh, I'll be here as long as takes. Say that one more time. I'm here, so you have two members at least. Okay. Could we stay for 20 minutes to hear the presentation? Yeah. Okay. I, th I think we could probably cut it down a little bit too. I mean, okay. especially if you want to have this one of two sessions. I, I, I think yeah, I saw Council Member Rodriguez say 10. <laughs> yeah, we, we'll try and keep it as. as um, as short as possible. I think, you know, I think it's important to just have this discussion here, particularly given that there was some reporting in the LA Times recently about exactly um, this, about this issue, about the CES and some of the challenges in it. We've been seeing different kind of entry points into challenges with CES over these past few weeks. The voucher issue has been one. Um, the inability to, to kind of move people into permanent supportive housing as quickly as we wanted and seeing vacancies there is another, which we've discussed in our previous meeting. Um, and then the most recent uh, LA Times article talked about how uh, the, the vulnerability assessment um, that is used that undergirds the CES system that we've built here has potentially some racial inequity built into it. Um, and the, you know, those results of that study were very troubling. And so I think it is important as we're thinking about moving forward in changing some of the ways in which we think about how we place people and the assessment tools that we're using to place people and the processes that we have an understanding in this committee, a baseline understanding of what is CES, uh, what is the assessment tool. Um, and so that's why I've, I, I've asked um, our leadership at LASA to, to provide us a little bit of background on this issue. Um, and we can certainly save discussion on this item for the next meeting, but I hope that committee members will be able to stay and hear this because I think it's useful for us to be on the same page about what does the system look like right now so that we can think about how can we change it to meet the current challenges and needs of this moment. So with that, I want to throw it over to Molly Reisman um, and Felicia Adams-Kellum to uh, to present today. Oh, uh, Molly, you'll be presenting. Yeah. And okay. And <laughs> Good afternoon, council members. Thank you for sticking in there with us for this. Uh, Molly Reisman, LASA's chief program officer. Um, and uh, I am joined by uh, two amazing colleagues, Marina Genchev, our acting director of the systems and planning department and Kiara Payne, our associate director of permanent housing. I'm gonna kick us off and then pass to my colleagues. Um, so first, before we get started, I just wanna thank um, this committee for requesting this presentation. Um, as Councilwoman Rahman said, it's incredibly timely. Um, and just wanna set the context by saying, we should both be proud of our system in Los Angeles. We were one of the earliest coordinated entry systems and it is now a national best practice. Um, but we also need to simultaneously take a very hard look at the opportunities to redesign our system during this current state of emergency and the need to approach our work with an increased sense of urgency. We know that many of you have experienced frustrations with CES. We know that you wanna see our unhoused neighbors that are in your bridge home, roadmap, tiny home village sites, moving into permanent supportive housing. Um, and we are excited to share this presentation about what CES is and how we can partner together to achieve that goal. So if we can go to the next slide. Um, like I said, in 2011, um, Los Angeles launched one of the earliest coordinated entry systems in the nation. 
The goal was to bring together diverse resources provided by various funders to ensure that no matter where someone tried to access housing and services in the county, they would not encounter a wrong door or a dead end. We know that homes end homelessness. We have a responsibility to ensure that we're using our housing resources as efficient and equitably as possible to get people to homes so that they can end their homelessness. This is life-saving work and it has tremendous urgency to it. Next slide. So what is CES? It's important to remember where we were 12 years ago and why CES was created and why it's become a national best practice. The idea of prioritizing resources emerged as a national priority because at that time, studies showed that most permanent supportive housing units were not going to people experiencing chronic homelessness. The people experiencing homelessness who were most likely to die on the streets were effectively being shut out of our highest level of care housing for people experiencing homelessness. Permanent supportive housing developers at that time were using first come first serve approaches or lotteries. Um, to lease up their buildings. And the people with the greatest barriers could not navigate that application process. Additionally, the capacity of homeless service providers across the country looked or across the county looked extremely different in different regions. It used to be that you saw high capacity service provision in the areas of the city where nonprofits had access to wealthy donors like the West Side and extremely limited capacity in under-resourced areas like South LA. CES was created to ensure that whether you tried to access services in Venice or South, South LA, you'd have access to a high capacity organization that could navigate you to housing. Our system did a lot of work to increase resources so that community providers would have access to those resources no matter what part of the city they were in and that they would have the capacity to use those resources to have the highest impact. CES created a network of service providers that covered the entirety of the city and the county, including a coordinated outreach network, so as to ensure that no matter where someone was experiencing homelessness, they had a chance to get connected to life-saving services and housing. Next slide. There is often confusion about what coordinated, it, coordinated entry is and why it was created. Um, also want to reference that in 2017, HUD mandated that all continuums of care created a coordinated process for access to homeless services governed by common policies and procedures. When we think about CES, we often think about one of the most valuable and costly resources, which is permanent supportive housing, or what we'll refer to as PSH. But CES also coordinates all programs and services that someone experiencing homelessness may need to access, including outreach, interim housing, housing navigation and various housing programs like rapid rehousing and emergency housing vouchers. While coordinated entry relies on standardized assessment, which is currently the VI SPDAT for the adult system, this is only one element of the entire system. It's important to note that CES does not create more resources, but instead attempts to maximize coordination of the limited resources available for people experiencing homelessness. While well, CES helps facilitate access to some housing resources, as we'll share more in the presentation, CES does not govern voucher issuance or the lease up process, nor does it determine eligibility requirements set by funders like documentation requirements, area median income, age requirements, et cetera. And as mentioned previously, CES has become synonymous with the VI SPDAT but this is only one piece of the system, and it's actually a tool we've been actively stepping away from for the last year because of concerns about it. Next slide. So, just, sorry, just to clarify, um, Molly, we don't, we're not required to use the VI SPDAT as part of the CES, right? No, you just have to have a common assessment tool, which is why we're in the process of developing a new tool, which we'll talk about. Thank you. Um, so while LASA as a continuum of care lead is designated as the entity to implement CES in Los Angeles, we alone do not create system policies. Instead, LASA relies on a policy council made up of diverse stakeholders who have a vested interest in continuing to refine and improve the system. As you can see, the policy council is made up of city and county representatives, philanthropic partners, and service providers. The city of LA is represented on the policy council by Ann Sewell. Um, the Policy Council is charged with making policies for the core tenants of CAS, which are access, assessment, prioritization, and matching. 
It's important to note that policy council does not make funding decisions or funding recommendations. Um, additionally, our policies are set within are set by funders and do not seek to. We don't change eligibility eligibility requirements placed on any housing resource. Rather, the goal of the policy council is to work towards alignment and coordination of programs and other resources within the rehousing system. Um, and for the next slide, I'm going to turn to my colleague Marina Genchip. Thanks, Molly. Um, so we want to share some of the recent changes happening, not only in the system as a whole, but also at the policy council level before we go into some of the changes about the system itself. Um, in recent years, as more resources have come online in the homeless services system, the policy council found itself in a position of needing to create new and more policies in order to speak to how new resources and new programs should operate within the suite of existing homeless services programs. So in order to reduce this duplication of effort and to ensure that all of these new resources continue to be used according to system principles, Policy Council reworked its core set of policies, revising them to be high-level, principle-based policies that speak to how resources generally should be used in the system. So for example, the access policy speaks to things like valuing equity, being person-centered in our response and making sure that we're not discriminating. When we talk about assessment, we're thinking about standardizing administration, valuing participant autonomy in this process, and prioritization and matching, which is referral to resources, needs to be grounded in the housing first model, ensuring resources are utilized to the best of our ability, and striving for system flow through homeless service programs and out of homelessness. So by having high-level principle-based policies, what we do is we create more flexibility um, in our policy structure that allows for more responsivity to system needs, which is an especially important thing given all the changes in our system. So later in this presentation, you'll hear about a number of the pilots and other system refinement efforts that are currently underway as we work to redesign the system to meet our needs today. Next slide, please. Um, so as we've mentioned, uh, the assessment is one of the core elements in CES. Probably folks did read that article uh, about the tool recently, so allow us to give a little bit more supplemental information. Um, while there are different assessment processes and tools in place for different populations or subpopulation systems that might experience homelessness, as well as for different programs or stages and engagement. Um, for better or for worse, coordinated entry is most known for the VI SPDAT, which stands for Vulnerability Index Service Prioritization Decision Assistance Tool. Um, HUD does require that we would have a standardized assessment. However, we definitely can have different ones for different people and different stages, um, depending on where what folks need. At the time that the VI SPDAT was chosen for LA, there were not other standard assessment tools to choose from. And despite the limitations of this current tool, which we've referenced some, and I will also speak to, the VI SPDAT at this point is still the wide, most widely used assessment tool in the country today, which isn't, doesn't necessarily excuse that we um, are still using it, but it explains that this is the kind of status quo and we're having a hard, we're in the process of moving away from it, as we mentioned. The VI SPDAT includes a number of questions designed to assess the vulnerability of people experiencing homelessness to help make decisions about how to prioritize them. It's questions about history of housing, experience of homelessness, disabling conditions, um, violence, uh, daily functioning, etc. Homeless service providers administer this tool. They put the information into a database that does produce a score. However, it's important to note that that score is not the be all end all. It's not the only way that decisions are made. It's not required for the majority of our housing resources. So that score is not required for interim housing. It's not required for rapid rehousing. And it is not the only thing that we use for permanent supportive housing. It is one of multiple factors. Um, so uh, fast forwarding to then the work that we're doing to change how we lean on this current tool. Um, in 2019, prompted by equity concerns raised by the ad hoc committee on black people experiencing homelessness, LASA partnered with United Way and the Hilton Foundation to fund a research team from USC and UCLA to launch the CES Triage Tool Research and Refinement Project, which was designed to use data and community input to refine the current tool that we use in our system. Um, Sester, uh, early, early findings of this evaluation continue to indicate that there are equity concerns with that tool and its administration. So as such, as we mentioned, LASA has proactively limited use of this tool, narrowing its application only to permanent supportive housing and we are actively piloting other ways to prioritize and refer to permanent supportive housing. So we're leaning on that score less. Um, the full report from this evaluation or from this um, from this uh, the evaluation will come out this spring. 
and we look forward to sharing these learnings with other communities that desire to also step away from the BI SPDAP and yet they're struggling for um, another tool or another process or way to do this. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, given the limited quality, quantity of valuable PSH in the system, we often correspond or correlate CES with PSH. However, it's important to note that CES works to align different programs that promote flow of people through homeless services back to safe and stable housing. So this often starts with moving people connected to outreach programs into interim housing and then subsequently moving them to other permanent housing programs like rapid rehousing or permanent supportive housing, which often includes that supplemental service piece to help support retention. So given the emphasis on permanent supportive housing, however, um, we do wanna provide some clarification on this slide and the next about the role of CES in the PSH referral process. So some PSH subsidies do require referrals from CES as uh, such as continuum of care um, funded programs or subsidies. Some, fund, um, some funders do require resources to be coordinated through CES. This includes some HUD programs, emerge, like emergency housing vouchers, some state programs, some DMH uh, funded programs and intensive case management services funded by the health um, department. Other funding sources like housing choice vouchers, while they don't require use of CES, can go through CES if chosen by the funder. Um, and as previously noted, uh, permanent supportive housing prioritization policies right now um, do uh, are established by policy council and de and define how we um, how applicants are matched to permanent supportive housing. The current prioritization policy does require the assessment um, using the VI SPDAT and matching the people who meet unit and subsidy eligibility along with the high VI SPDAT score. So next slide, please. Um, so this slide demonstrates what is quite a lengthy and complex process of helping someone move through the PSH lease up process. While this lease up process now happens in the context of CES, it's, it's important to note this process also predates the creation of coordinated entry. So as previously mentioned, prior to CES, people experiencing homelessness would often need to navigate this complex process without supports from case management staff, and additionally um, may have been significantly less likely to retain their housing without services available through intensive case management services. So I'll note that the multiple players in this process are color coded at the bottom of the screen. So you can kind of skim that there. Um, and that's also interesting to note that LASA, while we do play a key role in referring people into this process, um, we're in blue, we're actually only step two. However, we do work with our partners trying to support and steward a smooth and streamlined process um, as people move through various different funders along this, along this way. Um, it's important to also note that private property management companies and public housing authorities are responsible for the majority of the steps in this process. Um, next slide. So as previously noted, um, CES doesn't increase housing resources. That is one of the challenges. I'll go over a couple other challenges um, to this complex leasing process. Um, the list of people who are eligible potentially and have need for permanent supportive housing in LA City and County is in the tens of thousands. Um, it's challenging to match oftentimes to layered eligibility requirements of units, rental subsidies and services because each of those elements adds different eligibility requirements to which a person needs to be connected or uh, be eligible for. And sorry, this, that, that match is hap but happens through CES though, right? So like correct. The, the eligibility criteria for a single, uh, for a unit is inputted into CES and then individuals are matched to it based on whether they meet that criteria? Yes, that's correct. Um, we do our best to understand that eligibility. And as somebody actually applies, for example, maybe their income isn't exactly what they said, or there might be something that's slightly different, but a coordinated entry attempts to get the best understanding of eligibility so that we're passing along somebody into the process who is most likely eligible for that process. Yes, so we're trying to do that matching of eligibility on the front end. Um, there's often an extensive documentation requirements for this process, as you can imagine. Um, of course, there's also uh, capacity limitations for provider and staff turnover, which do present challenges and can exacerbate the complexity of this process. Um, some units like permanent supportive housing units, um, like, uh, excuse me, single room occupancy or um, veteran administered VASH units are often declined or um, may often be declined based on um, you know the location that they might be in or other preference of the applicant 
Um, and lastly, some PSH units are not necessarily structured to reflect the needs of people experiencing homelessness. By that, we mean some of those uh, criteria as they get layered on create a scenario in which it's hard to imagine a person, even a single person who might meet certain very specific criteria. When that happens, it's very difficult to fill that unit because despite a number of people experiencing homelessness, we're looking for a very specific cross section of eligibility criteria. Um, so with that, for next slide, I will pass it over to my Kiara, Kiara Payne. Yes, thank you, Marina. So now we'll go over our collection or um, convening of the PSH Provider Advisory Board Group. It is a group that meets twice a month um, in collaboration with housing developers and property management companies on understanding the challenges that they are enduring while leasing up their buildings. Their priorities include doc, doc match, document ready matching, uh, being able to do multiple matches or referrals for each unit they have within their building, some of the limiting concentrations of high acuity households, so basically being able to balance low acuity households and high acuity households in one uh, project in, over, in order to stabilize the um, project, but also improving the processes to fill vacancies. Um, this board started to meet in June 2022 and has continued very strongly to hold to the two um, meetings a month to address the barriers and challenges that they are facing, but not also just addressing and voicing them, but coming up with recommendations in which we have and will continue to invite our CES partners to hold those individual challenges and barriers the most um, to see if we can come to a resolve to be able to drive up the utilization of these units. I would like to, um, to announce that we have addressed two of the priorities that are on this um, slide so thus far. The first being that we have implemented document ready matching for PSH matching across the county as a preference, which means that we are direct, we are matching households that have two documents, whether it is their social security card and their ID, cost already uploaded in HMIS, and a means to be sure that we are reducing the time that they are being able to move throughout the application process when they meet with the property management company. And when, have, you, when you say you're doing that, that just means you are prioritizing them in making a match. That if you, you saw two applicants who met the criteria for households, that you would pick the applicant that? That has the documents uploaded in HMIS, yes. Um, I, it's Felicia. I, I think the thing to point out is to say that this is one of the key barriers. When we have an apartment that's available and you have a client or participant, the, the fact that they don't have their documents um, is a real barrier. And so one, it, it's a motivation to get documents ready to, to make sure that that person has everything they need. And it also says, let's expedite everyone in the system with documents move them more swiftly. So I think it's important to note that that is a key component of moving the system along more swiftly. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I wanna also address that we have met with our ICMS um, provider, which is the Department of Health Services to address the um, developers and property managers ability to do multiple matches for each of their units. We met with them last week and they were able to provide our board with an option to do that. And we'll continue to discuss that um, as an option for them moving forward um, to address those needs. Our next couple can, minutes- Can I just jump in there as another point? I think the council members just really need to know that we're addressing the things that are most salient to the developers and what we see throughout the system as barriers to moving swiftly. And that again is having a unit and looking for that person um, who's next in line to get the unit, but we can't uh, get in contact with them. Perhaps their homeless situation is resolved, and yet holding on to that unit can really delay things. So multiple matches uh, or referrals to a unit really can expedite to ensure that if that person who's first is not there, they've been resolved, you can go to the next, and it really does speed up the process. So I just want to underscore that. Thank you. 
Thank you um, for that as well. Um, I wanted to add that our next um, CES partner that we will be inviting to join these meetings will be our PHA, PHA partners who are heavily involved in improving the process to fill vacancies as we are looking at the timetable that is taken for an application to be reviewed and approved and able to move a client into the unit and hope to be able to reach some type of common ground or expedited um, process on that front. Next slide, please. So I wanted to highlight a success story for a project on key site that we had in spot six um, in collaboration with Council District 8 um, for a 36 unit family unit building in which we we implemented some new strategies in order to expedite the lease up of this building due to um, the PHA alerting us that if they did not receive 95% occupancy, they were in danger of losing funding for this project. Um, some of those strategies that we implemented, including matching people from outreach and interim housing programs within the spa with two to four documents uploaded in HMIS. I mentioned earlier that the two leading documents are the social security card and the ID, where the second and the third documents were their of income as well as verification of disability for the chronically homeless um, units that require that eligibility. Um, in addition, we were able to have property management and public housing authorities do concurrent application reviews to save time instead of the, um, the consecutive review, but we also had the uh, the ability to have a hackless staff provide real time updates and expedited application review on our weekly lease of calls that really allow for us to kind of troubleshoot any issues that they were having at the PHA with each household um, instead of having to work on the communication back and forth by phone or by email. So really ex expediting that. Some of the key takeaways from that is that lots of really um, supported heavily and facilitating those weekly lease up calls, which is usually held by developers and property owners. Um, in partnership with DHS, we were able to reduce the ICMS match decline timeline from 30 days to five days in order to meet our lease up target date. Um, in the collaboration with all of those strategies and the efforts of all of the partners for this particular project, we were able to lease up this building from match to occupancy of 100% of those units within 45 days. And that we really, really want to emphasize that having the HACLA team on the call weekly was very pivotal in helping us keeping those applicants moving. And if any time there was an issue with connecting with a client or collecting with a PLC, we were able to stay on that call at that time. We need to do this. If we're not able to reach that client within five days, we were declining that client for our match and then moving on to the next person in the queue. Next slide, please. Uh, just before you go on, I mean, uh, uh, Council Member uh, Rahman, I know you said eventually we will be coming together to try to make some recommendations of how to improve the process and have the Council members feel much better about um, coordinated entry and understand what we can do differently. And the reason why we've given these examples is these are perfect examples of what we could lean into doing more of and have the council members feel better about what they're doing to make sure the right people get into their building. So these are just examples of some of the things that LASA is doing that are working. I want to give you some data and some examples so that when we come up with a plan, you have some sense of what's working to, to decrease the time. Thank you. Yeah, this is useful and I believe we have um... We have, we still have quorum and I believe we'll have quorum till five. So we, is that, unless I'm mistaken? Okay, so let's keep going. And if we can get through some of these additional slides, I think we can maybe even take a question or two and then um, move some of the discussion to the next meeting. But for me, this has been very helpful and I hope it's been helpful for the other committee members as well. So in efforts to continue the success of Brian Hurst, we have looked at collectively a redefining or refining our CES project-based PSH match to move in uh, process in which we have implemented a pilot of about six to eight buildings in which we are looking to attach um, or to really ensure that we are doing quicker CES matches that we are ensuring that matches are being made to people that are experiencing homelessness in the area and enrollment of outreach and interim housing programs. 
but we're also continuing to do that active management of lease of calls with LASA as the lead agency on those calls with property management and the PHA application process, dedicated PHA staff on those weekly calls, and a reduction of ICMS match the clients from 30 days to 14 days as well so that we can get closer to the 45 days that we have seen at Brinehurst in which um, we believe we can replicate and should be able to replicate moving forward. And if you haven't, ex if you explain this already, I, I apologize, but ICMS match decline, what is that? So when we match a client to a project-based unit, it comes with a subsidy and the service slot. The service slot is, is considered the ICMS service slot and in their integrated that's the integrated case management services intensive case management intensive. Service. yes um in their pre in DHS's current scope of work they require for service providers to continue engagement with those clients for a total of 30 days before we could match the client them so as Dr. Adams Kellen was um was mentioning earlier service providers as well as property managers were experiencing long times in which they had to continue to reach out to clients that they weren't able to get in contact with and which was delaying the time in which we could fill that unit um, property managers have added this as an additional challenge especially when units are able to be moved into because they're losing rent on those units while we're still having to work on finding the clients so having this reduction of 30 days to 14 days in which Brian Hurst, we did it down to five days due to the lease up target, um, that we are hoping will help us be able to fill um, the units quicker in addition to having those clients be document ready um, and not have to wait on those crucial documents to move through the application process. Okay. That, next slide, please. So here you will find a list of all the buildings that are currently in our PSH match to move in pilot. As you will see, it is made up of buildings within spots four, two, and six. Um, and it also looks at all the populations that we serve from single adults, um, transitional age youth, and families with minor children. Um, just to give you an overview of this pilot, it will, uh, have two pieces of the strategy, one which is to um, drive in the targeted outreach of looking at matching those who are long-term um, stayers and interim housing programs, as well as those who have experienced homelessness longer within um, connections to outreach programs within the spa. But also we were able to do that for two buildings, um, PHK Soto, as well as Roof T from the beginning of matching those programs. I mean, those projects, however, we will be implementing that strategy to any turnover matches. So any matches that we have to uh, make as a secondary or third time for a unit because we weren't able to successfully lease up the client that was matched the first time. And but all projects will have the active system management in which we also will lead those lease up calls to make sure that we're moving clients through the application process swiftly. Um, and gaining 100% occupancy as fast as we can. And we heard from council members that they're concerned about their investment in interim housing and moving them through and into the permanent housing resources that they've invested in and, and, and helped raise dollars for it. So this is a, you know, a real important um, area of progress because you've got the interim, you need to have the throughput into the permanent housing resources that you've championed and this is going to be a way to do that next slide please so what we hope to find out and evaluate from this matching pilot is that um, to look if we are are reducing our lease up timeline um, to also increase project-based utilization within the city as well as our continuum um, across the board to also look at equity in regards to the PSH placements of these projects, but also to determine if there is a true success of relying on outreach and interim housing programs as a part of local engagement strategies around those buildings. Some of the additional things that we would like to add to the pilot um, and haven't really fully fleshed out yet, and but still wanted to start the process 
was to look at how we could mirror something similar to multiple matching by sending out match emails to more than one applicant for these units pre-match to determine if they're eligible for the unit as well as there's their interest. Uh, we would like to more so collectively look at targeted engagements of interim housing and outreach programs that are geographically closer to those buildings. And we are currently collaborating with our HUD technical assistance to make sure that the implementation and operation, operalization of that strategy is still um, in compliance with fair housing. Uh, we would like to um, explore doing a concurrent application review of property management and public housing authority applications. Um, as we have seen, that was a success with the Bryanhurst um, project, but also asked for an expedited application review at PHAs as well, um, because that was a success with a project home key site, but we have not seen that applicated, um, that expedited application review for some of our Triple H buildings or other project based buildings um, thus far. And now I'm going to send it over back to my colleague, Lee. Thank you, Kiara. Kiara is an extraordinary expert in this process and oversees our matching team and is a great resource um, for all of you to reach out to when you have questions. Um, so we wanted to share, if we can go to the next slide, um, that we have a few other pilots we're doing to really try and innovate as much as possible. Um, one of those is uh, we are taking, we see a significant number of vacancies in single room occupancy buildings. These are buildings with some of the earliest PSH units in LA and they were rehabilitations of buildings in Skid Row that provide rooms and don't include individual bathrooms or kitchens. Many people matched to SROs decline these units. To address this, we have a pilot with SRO housing that allows SRO to identify people interested in SROs and then loss of matches to those, those applicants to the units. And then they proceed with the lease up process. Um, our second pilot that we're working on, uh, in addition to this is we're working on uh, ensuring that people are housed through time limited subsidies who need permanent supportive housing have the opportunity to transfer in place, which means we match them to a tenant based PSH voucher with integrated case management services and then allow them to transfer their existing lease from the time limited subsidy to the PSH voucher and then have that integrated case management services as well. And finally, we've created an electronic application called the Universal Housing Application or UHA that we are currently piloting. The UHA allows case managers to complete one electronic application that flags any incomplete information rather than submitting two paper applications. So this achieves three critical improvements in our system. It allows us to make applying for housing easier. It helps us ensure complete applications are submitted for housing. And it allows LASA to track where the application is in the process so that we can assist with applications being processed efficiently. So that's currently being piloted right now as well. Next slide. We know that there's a lot of work ahead to create a CES that we can all be proud of. We are ready for this challenge and we have tremendous work underway to make this happen. HACLA and LACDA are working on a waiver request to HUD to restore some of the flexibility that we had during the pandemic to do things like self-certify identification documents, income, disability status, as well as have landlords self-certify uh, habitability of units. Under the pandemic HUD flexibility is we could move people into units with self certifications and then we had six months to provide all of the required documentation to the housing authority which allowed us to move applicants in much faster. We are also committed to changing how we use our triage assessments. We know that triage tools both the VI SPDAT but even the new SESTER tool have limitations. We're committed to creating matching procedures that allow triage tool scores to no longer be the deciding factor on who gets matched to units. As we've said at the top of the presentation, we know that you want to see your unhoused neighbors and ABH and roadmap and tiny home villages moving into PSH. We're going to continue to refine how we use program enrollments in those programs to help us connect people in neighboring programs to PSH that's being leased up. We also know that different types of units require just different strategies, and we're going to continue to refine our approaches for SROs, FAST units, and other unique unit types. Um, until HUD allows HACLA to accept self-certifications, we do need to ensure that people matched to units can provide the documentation to lease up. 
Um, when we match people who don't have documents, it leads to units sitting empty for months at a time. So people without documents are able to lease other subsidy types like time limited subsidy, but for the federal subsidies, we really need this documentation. So as you heard on February 4th, 1st, we did the document ready preference for people with IDs and social security numbers. Our next step is later this spring, we're gonna expand that to people with other critical documents, including income verification and disability documentation. Um, as you've heard throughout the presentation, coordination is the key to success. And we're working closely with our partners like HACLA and Department of Health Services to work in lockstep to fill vacancies quickly. And our last slide, we just want to say we're committed to working closely with the city and other PSH partners to design a CES we can all be proud of. We know that our current homeless crisis requires us to get people into vacant units immediately. We know that our unhoused neighbors must have access to resources without wrong doors or dead ends. We also know that our system has to be efficient and equitable, and that has to be our North Star, those two values. Um, we also know that community partners must have trust in this process and that the process must work for all PSH funders and partners. We cannot do this alone. It has to be a collaborative effort and we encourage all of your offices to engage with us around this. We welcome your feedback and are excited to partner with the city on this work. And with that, I will stop and open for questions if we have time. Well, we don't really have time for questions today, unfortunately. It's 5 p.m. and I know that we're about to lose quorum on this committee. So I wanted to just thank you for that detailed presentation. I, I, I thought it was fantastic. I thought it gave us an incredible grounding in how the system works and I think will allow us to ask some detailed questions in our next meeting. Um, Ms. Adam Kellum, I just wanted to ask whether you had any you know, anything you wanted to say to close us out today, um, coming in as a new head of LASA, I think we're all really excited. We're so grateful that all of you made the time to put this together, because I think it's a real sign to me that we, we see the criticisms of the system and our response is not that we're going to be defensive or, um, or that we're going to um, say that the criticism is wrong. We're gonna say, no, we're gonna fix it and here's how we're gonna do it. And I love it, I love this energy. Um, and I'm so excited to be a partner with all of you in it. So I just wanted to throw the floor to you before we close out today. Well, thank you so much. And I think you you said it all really. Um, th there's reasons for why we had a coordinated entry system. And um, now there's uh, the need to adapt that model. And um, the LASA team has done a great job looking at avenues for adapting into the needs and the time, this emergency. We know very clearly what the council members are concerned about, and I believe that the pilots and the adjustments can address that. And we look forward to partnering with all of you to come up with a policy, a plan, so that everyone wins and that we are moving swiftly and doing what we know is right in this time of, of crisis. Thank you so much. And I think on those words, we can close out today's meeting. Um, if that's fine with everyone else on the committee, I wanna thank you all for staying till 5 p.m. I wanna thank you again for that detailed presentation, Molly, Kiara, and others at LASA. It was really, really fantastic. And I will ensure that the other committee members who are not here um, take a look at it. I know that they, they just had other commitments that you know couldn't be avoided, but um, so that when we come back next time, we're all interrogating this issue from the same um, kind of base of knowledge. Uh, from a deep understanding of the system that we're in. So I wanna thank you again. And with that, I think we can, is there anything else on the agenda, Mr. Verano? The desk is clear, Madam Chair. Great. Okay, so let's adjourn. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much.